Hello and welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff this week on the show. It is another Weekly Suit Gundam Extravaganza, the first in a six-part series where we will be reviewing all the episodes of Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin, the OVA that came out between 2015 and 2018 and is uh, one of the best Gundam things. So... Mm -hmm. I am very excited to get started with all of that, Sean. Um, before we get to the Gundam uh, of it all, we will have a little bit of stuff for you at the top of today's show. Um, but yeah, how have you been, Sean? Been pretty good. Yeah, it's it's nice to be back on our our, our Gundam bullshit because it's been a little bit. <laughs> It's been a little bit. It's been since December um, or late November. I forget when we did Iron Blood. No, we did Iron Blood Orphans Part Two in December. So yeah. hasn't been that long. But I have been excited too because I got I actually got my Gundam Origin Blu-rays for Christmas. I'd seen the show before, but I didn't have it on Blu-ray, and so I'd had them kind of sitting there waiting to watch. And I was like, well, I'm not going to watch it until we talk about it. But I'm very excited. So uh, it'll be fun. Yes, although we did, we did, of course, on Christmas do the Cursed Gundam episode, so I don't we know did. if you count that or not. I did. It was a numbered episode. That was number 43 of Weekly Suit Gundam. Yeah, if people haven't listened to that, I don't know if you should or not. <laughs> they should. It's very weird and funny. That's the one we read Christmas Gundam fanfic that I found a surprising amount of. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Sean, do you have any stuff for us? What have you been up to? Um, just a couple of, of little things. Uh, I guess the main thing I want to talk about for the podcast is I've put a decent chunk of time into the Demon Slayer game, Himetsu no Kaiba. Himetsu no, Yai Himetsu no Yaiba. Um, Himetsu no Kaiba people. is when yes. Kaiba from Yu-Gi-Oh! starts fighting the demons. <laughs> yes, that's that's going to be the next movie. It's going to be it's just going to be a big spinoff uh, and crossover with Yu-Gi-Oh! No, but the Demon Slayer game, I think it's the Hinokami Chronicles, I want to say is the uh, English language title, um, but it's the CyberConnect 2 game, um, which people, if you have played any of the Naruto games, would know them from like the Ultimate Ninja Storm games, as well as they did Dragon Ball Z Kakarot a couple of years ago, and I've been a big fan of a lot of their stuff. Um, in that space of it being like these kinds of um, very for-the-fans kind of anime games, it's not like a Dragon Ball Fighters thing where it's just like a great game on its own. It's definitely something, and this is very much true of this game, that you have to be a fan of the source material, I think, to get much enjoyment from uh, the game. And so far, I'm a little bit mixed on this one um, in terms of I feel like they don't have enough material to adapt to give the game like the full kind of breadth that you really want from something like this. Um, but like the fundamentals of the game are very good for this kind of game and it does get the like um, core kind of fan stuff there. So basically what the game is, is it's a big 3D arena anime fighter. It's very much in the tradition of the Ultimate Ninja Storm Naruto game. So if people have played those, the combat system is pretty similar. Um, the, the dynamics of the whole kind of structure, the menus, all that kind of stuff. It very much feels like they took a lot of like the creative people that worked on that series and brought them over to this one. Um, and it's got a couple of different modes. It's got obviously your kind of versus mode thing um, with online and all that kind of stuff um, where you can pick your different fighters and play against other people. And then it has a story mode. And the story mode is the part of the game that I wish was stronger because it's sort of a weird blend between the Ultimate Ninja Storm 2 and 3 and the Ultimate Ninja Storm 4 story modes, which basically... The Ultimate Ninja Storm games in the second and third entry have these really big kind of adventure mode stories where it's almost like a light JRPG sort of thing where there's a big hub world and you walk around and those games had like these like cool pre-rendered backgrounds and all this kind of stuff and you just did side quests and went through the story of that section of the show. Um, and then when they got to Ultimate Ninja Storm 4, that was the point at which they only really had the very end of the series, and so the story mode for that game was just like a series of missions one after the other, and you just kind of hit them out, bam, 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 one after the other, um, and it was very much more action-focused and kind of took out the adventure elements, which was fine for me because 
that's what made sense for where that game was. With this game, with Demon Slayer, it's a little bit weird because since you only have basically the first season of the anime and then the movie to adapt, there's not like enough material of when the series is like in kind of full spin and you've got your full cast of characters running around and fighting demons that the early parts of the story mode have to kind of really try to make a big meal out of not a lot of material that's particularly good for a video game where it's just Tanjiro with Nezuko wandering around and fighting a couple of demons and that's kind of it. Um, and so they have not a big hub world the way that the Ninja Storm games had them. It's more of like you will go into missions designed after sections of the story and there will be little kind of wandering around segments where you run around a map and can find little like sort of collectible pickups and stuff like that. But they're very small. It's extremely boxed in and linear. There's not really much of a sense of exploration and it just kind of slows down the pace of the game in a way that it feels like padding because if you only did the main fights, there's only like maybe about eight fights in the section that they've adapted from the source material. And it's not a thing where it's like, you can't come up with, I mean, they could have, but like it would be harder to kind of come up with a bunch of not like new material and like new demons or something for him to fight. There's like a couple of kind of smaller little skirmishes you do that with kind of nondescript demon enemies. But generally speaking, they kind of keep the main content of the game pretty close to what the anime source material does. So that's like the part of the game that I wish was stronger, that feels a lot weaker than the Ultimate Ninja Storm games to me. But the core fundamentals of the game are really strong in such a way that I think like a sequel to this will probably be really good when they have more characters because the the visuals of the game are phenomenal. Um, it's the thing that like CyberConnect 2 has always been incredibly good at, which is replicating so much of the visual style of whatever the source material is while then also putting their own kind of unique visual flourishes on them. So all the characters' special moves look great. The way that they draw the effects on the screen, like the water following after Tanjiro's sword and stuff like that, looks fantastic. The big kind of ultimate attacks you do with your characters all are fucking amazing. And particularly if you end a fight um, with an ultimate move, it's really like cinematic in, in the way the like you win kind of thing pops up on screen and everything freezes. Um, it's that part is phenomenal. Uh, and it just in the music is um, there's some original music and then some music from the series as well. So there's kind of a blend there, which is cool because the Naruto games never had any of the Naruto music, I think, for licensing reasons. But you have like so like in the story mode, um, like I just finished last night. I finished the spider demon section. And when you get to the part where um, the, the, what's episode 19 in the show, which is the best episode of that first season and the big um, Tantra song that the lyrical song comes in as an insert song on um, that whole crazy end of that episode. Like, that stuff all happens in the game, and it's fucking awesome. And they have the song playing, um, and that whole uh, sequence is really amazing. So when the game gets to just kind of, like, focus on the stuff that the game is good at, which is the cinematic fights and the character stuff, and just, like, kind of recreating and allow you to run around and mess around with these characters in this fighting game format, I think the game is just as much fun as those Naruto games were. Um, it's just the stuff around the edges feels like there's just not enough material with the section that they've adapted for them to have like the pace that you want for a lot of the single player content in the game. Yeah, that makes sense. That's kind of what my worry about the game was, but then it sounds like everything that you'd want to be good about it is good. Um, yeah. you know, it sounds cool. It's something I want to pick up too when I can find it on sale. Um, it, it looks cool. I, I definitely, I mean, here's one question I have for you, Sean. Because I know I my answer to this is no. Have you ever played the first game in a franchise based on a big anime like this? No, it's just like, definitely not. No. Yeah, like, can you, like... And that's just, like, the thing is that, like, it's probably a miracle it's as good as it is. Mm -hmm. Because the first game... Like, there are going to be a lot of Demon Slayer games, Sean. There's going to be a whole mess of Kimetsu games one day. And I definitely... I have played my share of One Piece games and Dragon Ball games. And, you know, pick your favorite anime fan. You've played a lot of Naruto. None of us have played the, like, go back and find what was the first ever game made out of this thing. Yeah, I mean, God, um, you'd have to go to, like, an actual Famicom game if you wanted to do Dragon Ball. 
Yes, I mean, there is an original Dragon Ball Famicom game that was released in the U.S. as Dragon Boy um, before Dragon Ball was ever released over here, which I think is funny. But yeah, it's uh, so it's a weird thing. But yeah, I um, and for people who are wondering, because I get this question every so often, yes, we will review the second season of Kimetsu no Yaiba when it's finished airing, when it's all done. Uh, they're at like episode 15 of the season now, so if it runs the full two cores, there's probably like 10 weeks left. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to run. But yeah, when it's done, we will watch it and we'll do a big episode and it'll be fun. Yes. The thing I'll say, uh, a parting note on, on the Kimetsu no Yaiba game, is the thing about it that is my favorite thing, which is true about the Ultimate Ninja Storm games also, is I, I prefer the characters that are the weird niche characters that they put in over the like main characters. Like playing as Tanjiro is fun, obviously. Right. And those are the characters that get the most love, right? So that's why in... Because I, I reloaded and uh, booted up Ultimate Ninja Storm 4 the other day just to kind of, like, compare it. And I was reminded that there are, like, eight Nar versions of Naruto in that game. Um, because, of <laughs> course, there are. Because, you know, I mean, you go from Naruto being a, like, 10-year-old boy to him being, like, a dad in his mid-30s. Like, you have a lot of Narutos to, to get over the course of that uh, series. Um, and so you have all that and those characters have so much love and put into them. But then also I was like, oh yeah, but also they put Naruto's mom in this game who never fights in the series. I mean, you know that she would be able to fight, but you never actually see her do it uh, because she's, you know, you only ever see her in flashbacks because she's dead at the beginning of the series. Um, and it was like, and I played as her. I'm like, yes, this is the shit I want. I want them coming up with weird characters and giving them like very creative move sets. And there are a bunch of characters like that in this game, which is my favorite part. That you have um, Uda Kodaki is a playable character. You're sort of like the mentor that trains Tanjiro at the beginning. The nice. two kids, um, Sabito and the girl, I don't remember her name, but the two kids that like are ghosts that help him train around the boulder, both of them are playable. Um, and they all use the water style because they're trained by Udako Daki, which I think is a good touch. Um, and then also, I just unlocked and played a little bit as Murata, the sort of hapless demon slayer that gets introduced in the Spider Demon arc. Um, and he's <laughs> in the game also, and it's great. It's great. And, and that's the kind of stuff, that's the stuff that makes me excited for them eventually being able to, you know, obviously this game is going to get multiple sequels um, as the series continues to be adapted into animation. Um, and that's the thing I'm excited about is just give me the weirder characters. Give me all like the side characters. Give me like Hagen san the blacksmith guy. Like I want to play as him in a future game. You know, that's the kind of character and that's the kind of thing that, that cyber connect two is so good at um, because the way they realize those characters is so cool. It's not just a kind of, and eh, we're just going to throw it together just to fill out the roster. It feels like they put a lot of like love and care and really think about who is this character? How would they fight? Like, what do we do for their ultimate move? Um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's that's my that has been my favorite part so far of this game. That's awesome. That that makes me think of, especially with Naruto's mom. Like, One Piece games always have to have Shanks because, mm -hmm. of course, Shanks is cool. You know, he's got a great voice. He's he's the guy who gives Luffy the straw hat, all of that stuff. But Shanks is never that big in the series yet. He's like very mysterious. We don't know what his powers are. We just know that everyone on Earth fears him, or on the One Piece planet fears him. So I love that every One Piece game he is, he has a completely different power set that is just imagined. And it's uh -huh. like, and one day it will be proven completely wrong by the manga. But we've been almost 25 years and we don't know yet. So those poor game makers just have to make it up. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's always the best part. It's just yes. like... What, what what do they come up with to try to like give this character move set? It's like when you would be able to play as Bulma in some like Dragon Ball games. It's like ah, just give her some like weird robot shit, and she's got a shotgun and she runs you over with the motorcycle. I don't know. Or Mister Satan with his jetpack. Remember uh, in the Budokai yes. games? <laughs> yes. Now we're just remembering anime games of the past, which yeah, it is a it's a fun genre. I'm glad it's not dead. Yes, that and that is that is the prevailing feeling for me playing this game is like it's got its shortcomings for sure, um, but it is it is the kind of game that I feel like is few and far between these days because most of the kind of tie-in games mostly just exist in the mobile um, space and it's fun to just with as you say like a brand new series that is like hot right now and being able to play the first game adapting that stuff. Um, you, you can imagine a way way worse game um, than Hinokami Kaputan, which is good but not not as good as i would have liked it to be but if those fundamentals are there sean can you imagine the game made after they're done with the yeah. manga i mean man oh man 
there's there's some cool stuff coming. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you're I, an anime I, only watcher. I, I want there I want to have like you know, you're not gonna be able to have the like eight to ten tondros, but you could get a good three or four tondros in there and that would make me happy. Yes, that'd be very good. Um all right. In terms of video games, all I've been playing is Persona Five because if you haven't heard, Persona Five is a really long game. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've been playing Persona Five Royal. It's great. I'm over sixty hours in, so I'm at the point where you'd be done with Persona Three, but we're like halfway through Persona Five. I'm on the Okamura Dungeon, so we have Haru. I have the the full sort of core party. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen some some of the crazy Royal shit has started. I've I've I'll just yep. say I've had the first big thing with Kasumi and. Uh, my mind is properly fucked by where they're going with that. But anyway, um, it's a very good game. I'll save that more for the Persona 5 Royal episode that is probably coming soon, whenever I finish that game. We'll just, uh, whatever plans we had that week, we'll cancel and we'll do a big Persona 5 Royal episode and it'll be fun. Um, Sean, I do have one other big piece of stuff to talk about today, though. All right. Which is that I am recording this on a new computer. Um... Yeah, so it's a long story, and I will explain why I have done this, but I think people are sometimes interested in tech stuff, and uh, this one was fun for me to figure this out. So um, I had been recording for the last two years or so on a PC I got when my... So I had had a MacBook Pro that I got in 2015. That was the 2015 model. That was the last model before they like stripped out all the ports and put in the dumb touch bar and all that stuff. And I had that MacBook Pro for like six years. I had it for, I ran that thing into the ground, like until like yes. the battery was so bad I couldn't get through a single movie on it. That kind of like, I used the shit out of that computer. It, like the bulk of the Weekly Stuff podcast was made on that computer. Um, that died. I decided to switch over to PC, mainly because at the time, so this was middle, this was like early, mid 2020. And at the time, this was right before they started the Apple Silicon transition and made the Macs good again. And they had just, the MacBook Pro was just a piece of shit at that point. Intel has been very bad for a number of years. And then also they had no ports on those things. They had replaced the fucking function keys with the fucking stupid touch bar thing. Um, which I remember one time I went to a Best Buy to check that out and I saw the touch bar and I'm like, oh, this could be cool. And then I tried like turning the volume up and the way you had to turn the volume up on the touch bar was instead of hitting the volume button, you had to find the volume thing on the touch bar, hit that, and then it put up a slider and you I'm like, no, Uh why would you, why would you ever do that? That is, why would you make it harder to turn the volume up? This is bad. Nothing so, has ever been improved by replacing a physical button with a capacitive touchpad. It's just, it's, it's physical buttons are just better. Um, that's true. Yeah. Way. Yeah. It's very true. Anyway, so I jumped ship from Mac to PC. I got my uh, sort of gaming laptop PC, which was an Asus uh, ROG Zephyrus M15. I've been on that for a couple of years. And I was not happy with it for a number of reasons. The main one lately being... It had weird heating issues. It had a lot of sound issues. It never got... The the fans were always on. Now, this is just a part of the design of a lot of gaming laptops is that the fans always have to be on. So a low level I can deal with. They were getting higher and higher all the time. It was having just problems cooling itself. It had a bunch of other issues that were annoying me. So I'd been kind of looking around and feeling like, what could I do to sort of fix this? Um, And the thing is... I, I would have wanted to stay with Mac back in 2020 when I jumped ship if they were making the kind of computer I wanted, but they weren't. The thing is, earlier this year, or no, now we're in 2022, but in 2021, they put out the exact MacBook Pro I wanted in 2020 to like upgrade from my last one, which is they did these redesigned MacBook Pros, 14-inch and 16-inch, where they have the new, the Apple Silicon that has come out that is fucking miraculous technology and is the best stuff on the market like apple has jumped up above all the other laptops with these things and this is the ones with the m1 pro and m1 max in it um which is their new chips and basically looked like and then these computers they got rid of the touch bar they put back full size function keys they put in back in all the ports you got your hdmi you got your sd card you got your um headphone jack all of that they even put back in the mag safe charging that was so cool and was like the best part of the mac for a long time um And so I decided to give that a try, and I am now on the MacBook Pro 14, just the base model with the base M1 Pro, 8-core CPU, 14-core GPU. But, Sean, um, 
I have a couple of numbers to tell you why I am definitely like sticking with this and why because I kind of got it. I'm like, if I don't like it, I can always return it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to tell you, Sean, why this was the right move, especially for me, who is the one who like exports the podcast and does all of that work, right? Let me tell you this. So, Sean, on PC, I didn't have access to Final Cut Pro anymore. That was by far the hardest thing about leaving Mac. I really do like Final Cut. I use it for a lot of things. Um, and on PC, I was using a program called DaVinci Resolve, which is sort of modeled after Final Cut, but is free. Um, and so let's see. I wanna, I did a test, Sean, between that computer and this new MacBook Pro I'm on to kind of show this off. So um, what I did is I re-exported Weekly Suit Gundam number 24. That was, I think, the 8th MS Team one. But I just picked it because I had all the original elements and it was an mm-hmm. average length episode. It's two and a half hours. So that's a two and a half hour episode. Um, I used all the original elements, the original wave file, the original image, the original videos, all of that stuff. Put it in, recreated the timeline in DaVinci Resolve, exported it um, using the H.264 codec, 1080p, 24 FPS, so your basic stuff. It took um, twenty. It took about thirty minutes. It took right about thirty minutes to export. That was pretty average for me. Um, and then I also wanted to make note of this stuff. So thirty minutes to export, but the average fan noise on that was between forty-seven and fifty decibels, which is pretty loud. It did peak up above fifty at a couple times. Your CPU temps on that were eighty-four degrees average, which is hot to the touch, but not terrible. It would sometimes get up to the high eighties. Now, I should note, this is all with a recent DaVinci Resolve update, because for the first year I had this computer, um, Resolve had this terrible glitch where it would just max out your CPU and not lean on the GPU, and I would have to go in and manually undervolt my PC so it wouldn't burn it alive. Um, And even with all of that, it would run the CPU around 95 degrees with fan noise up above like 55 decibels. Very, very loud. Very, very hot. Worried for the future of my computer. Luckily, Resolve fixed that, but still not great. And of course, with a PC, you have to keep it plugged in. For whatever reason, PCs cannot do their max performance off of battery. They have to be off of the battery bank AC adapter thing. Um, Macs can run full bore either way. Um, But anyway, so that's the PC on Resolve. 30 minutes, loud, hot. MacBook Pro with M1 Pro. Same settings, H.264, 1080p, 24fps. Took 19 minutes and 53 seconds, so full third of that off. But here's the important one, Sean. I did that all on battery without the computer plugged in. It went from 83% battery to 79% battery, which is ludicrous. It never got hot. It never got warm to the touch. The fans never kicked in. It was totally silent. And in fact, Sean, I've had this for over two weeks now. I have never heard the fans. I have. There are fans on this device. I have never heard them. I have never felt it get hot other than when it's charging and batteries warm up while they're charging, obviously. Um, and... Like, the obvious upside of that is that the computer's going to last longer because it's not baking the CPU to do a fairly simple export. Mm -hmm. Um, And, of course, our video exports are pretty simple. They're mostly a static image. That still is a heavy task on a computer because you're rendering that static image 24 times for two and a half hours, right? 24 times a second for two and a half to three to four, however many fucking stupid hours we do for this show. Yeah, I was going to say, when you said two and a half hours is an average length of, like, no, that's below our average that's average maybe for other other podcasts or something but that's fairly average like for weekly suit gundam but yes <laughs> we we like to push the four hour mark even though we we tell ourselves we, do. we don't well i mean sean last week's episode was an uh, especially long one that was a little over three and a half hours long it was about three hours 40 minutes i did all of that that was the first one i recorded and exported on this mac that one only took 29 minutes to export only took up 6% of the battery. Again, no fans, no heat. I've done these... T- it's it's truly... The, and there's a bunch of other stuff about this computer that's amazing. It has the best screen I think I've ever seen on anything. TV, phone, iPad, whatever. It's a mini LED. It's like nicer than I would have asked for, but it's in the computer. Um, and it's the nicest screen I think I've ever seen on anything. Just in terms of color, reproduction, brightness, all of that. It's mini LED, so it's kind of like OLED. There's actual blacks when it's black because the lights just turn off. Um, all of that stuff. More than I need, but it's amazing. This is truly like Sean. This is like a revolutionary piece of tech for me in a way that I don't think I've ever felt using a new piece of tech. Because even my old MacBook, it 
was much better with like energy efficiency than my PC was, but it was still Intel and all of that, and so it would get loud and hot, and it would take a very long time to export our videos before. Having a computer where I can export everything like just off battery if I want, I don't need to, but if I want to do it off battery, it's not going to get hot, it's not going to make noise, which means the computer's going to last a much longer time because it's not putting that kind of strain on your CPU. The energy efficiency is amazing, and when we're recording this podcast, it is dead fucking silent. That was the biggest thing for me, is that computer, I was having to do a lot of stuff to manage the noise coming off of that machine, and it was becoming untenable to record this podcast on it, in addition to other stuff like a lot of PC laptops like that you just really can't take around with you because they might be light on their own but then they have very bad battery life and you have to take around this giant fucking brick and then it becomes not portable. Um, So anyway, this was, I think, uh, a good purchase and I'm very happy with it because it is an amazing piece of tech and again, that performance from the custom Apple Silicon is no fucking joke and I'd seen a lot of these numbers for myself but like seeing them or seen a lot of these numbers from other people, but seeing them for myself was like a, holy shit, I'm so amazed that this thing is doing this. Yeah, that's awesome. Does it, I'm curious, because I remember on your old MacBook, there was like an issue with Audacity where you had to like manually, I forget what it was, but you had to do some fucked up weird shit to get Audacity to run. Was that fixed? uh, That's been fixed. That was fixed before I got rid of that Mac. That was an Audacity side thing. Yeah, they just had not updated it in a while. Um, I mean, and here's the other thing, Sean, that is really amazing about the compatibility on this. Since now Macs are using custom Apple Silicon, remember all those apps were originally made for Intel processors. Mm -hmm. So all of the like native Mac apps they've updated and they run natively on the M1. Um, A lot of third-party apps have updated, like all the Microsoft apps I use, other than OneDrive. They still need to update OneDrive, but all of the other ones run natively. Um, But a lot of other apps like Audacity are still written for Intel, so they run through an emulation software called Rosetta 2, which is completely invisible. You don't have to activate it or anything. It's in the background. It's completely flawless. Like Audacity also is much faster for me than it has been on other machines. Some of that is also due to disk speed and stuff but like um yeah i have not had those problems with audacity um i have not had really problems with anything other than there's some things i prefer windows for there are also some things i've always preferred mac os for you're never going to have a perfect experience Mm -hmm. but like i'm someone who can go between the two operating systems pretty easily the only significant thing i'm missing is some of the games i had on pc but i have other ways i can access that if i need to um and frankly, PC gaming. My my the thing that kind of broke me on that was Resident Evil Village when that came out so fucked up. And I'm like, oh yeah, there's no reason to play new games on PC <laughs> because they're going to be fucked up more often than not. Um, yeah, it's always it's always a roll of the dice. Um, that's yeah. for sure. That you, you never yeah. know exactly what you're going to get. I mean, and everything on this computer is ludicrously nice. Even you probably noticed right now, Sean. My webcam looks. This is a built-in webcam that is so much better than the... I had an external one on my... Because my last computer didn't have a webcam on it. And um, the one that's built into this MacBook is, like, super nice. Um, It's really cool. They even... The weirdest thing about this computer, and the only thing that gave me any hesitation, is the webcam is built into this notch that's kind of like the notch on the iPhone now. And I thought, that seems stupid for a computer. The way they've implemented it is absolutely genius, where the screen has its normal Mac 16 by 10 aspect ratio, and then the menu bar has been moved out of that into an extra space above the main screen. That's where the notch is. And when you're in any full screen app, they just black that out. And because of its mini LED and the lights just go off, you literally can't see the notch. So they actually found a way to do it and give you extra screen real estate. That's like one of the smartest little Apple moves I've ever seen. Yeah, that's smart because, yeah, I remember that being a thing that when they showed the design, it was like a real head scratcher when you looked at it because it was just like, this seems like it doesn't make any sense. Um, Yes. (laughs) Yes, that like hearing you describe how that actually works, that it's not just, no, when you're looking at an image, you just have a weird rectangle cut out at the top. Um, It's good that it's it's not doing that because that seemed insane. Um, It seemed like it was impossible that that was how it worked. uh, And it's good to know that that isn't how it works. Like, if anything, again, the way they've done it has made it a benefit because you have extra screen real estate on your main desktop and in other areas. Because the menu bar, which on Mac OS is an omnipresent top thing, um, is never cutting into your work now. So there's stuff like that. I've, I've watched a lot of videos on it. They look gorgeous, Sean. Um, I, you will like this. I have started watching one of your favorite TV shows, Deadwood. Um, yes. And I was watching that the other night on, on here. 
And the speakers on this thing are also, in, they're, they're literally nicer than the speakers on my 55-inch TV. I, can't, I don't know how they did it, but the speakers are amazing. Ian McShane's voice sounds very good coming out of them. Um, but I, and, and again, on that battery life stuff, I streamed. The Deadwood Pilot is a solid hour long. I had it on like 75% brightness. I think it went down one battery percentage. This thing just like sips battery on basic tasks like that. So it's insane. The only thing I've done on it that ate up battery fairly fast was this recording the podcast which makes sense because it's a zoom thing that we have going on for hours on end which is a dumb yes. thing to do on your computer um but that's how we record the podcast and there you go so very yeah. cool that's my computer story so i just i was i had to share some of those numbers because i was like literally looking at the data and like recording it and i'm like because i'm like this is the kind of like like it's very rarely i find anything performance wise on my computer where i'm like i want to share this but that was one of them because like that's pretty cool stuff so yeah awesome yeah. all right but anyway sean do you want to maybe move over and uh talk about some gundam i think jonathan it's time to talk about some fucking gundam Hello and welcome to Weekly Suit Gundam, the special bonus podcast brought to you by the folks at the Weekly Stuff Podcast. I'm Sean Chapman. And I'm Jonathan Lack. And we are here once again in a new year, in the year of our Lord, 2022. We're moving forward in years, but we're looking back to the past, back to where it all began, because we are today beginning our wonderful journey through something I've been wanting to talk about on the podcast in depth for a long time. I think we both have which is Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin, the OVA series made between 2015 and 2018, adapted from the same-named manga by Yoshikazu Yasuhiko. And we're going to be doing these one episode at a time to maybe actually, for once in our fucking lives, live up to the name of this podcast. And maybe it'll be weekly. I hope it'll be weekly. But we are talking about Blue-Eyed Castle, the first episode today. Yes, of Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin, the OVA, which... This is one where we have both seen it. Um, I watched this back in my initial Crazed Gundam binge for longtime listeners will remember this. Sean, you and I recorded all of the, it was the first five episodes were Mobile Suit Gundam, the 43 episodes. Mm -hmm. And then, but we recorded them all pretty fast and they came out kind of tiered. And then before we recorded the sixth episode where we talked about the movie trilogy, I went on a binge and watched all of the like one year war OVAs. So I did War in the Pocket. I did 8th MS Team. I did the initial Thunderbolt stuff. Um, I forget what all I watched. I watched all of that. And I watched the Origin OVA. And then when I finished the Origin OVA, which if people have seen it, leads very directly into the beginning of Mobile Suit Gundam, that's when I watched the movie trilogy over again. And then we talked about it on the podcast. So I have seen the Origin. It's one of the first Gundam things I saw. It like colored my reading of Zeta Gundam and Char's Counterattack and all mm -hmm. of that. So it's uh, and it's long been one of my favorite things. And then I have also read the entire manga. The the manga as a whole is not the focus of these six episodes, but it is. If you don't know, the OVA is adapted from this middle arc in the manga, which in the twelve volume perfect bound version of the manga, which is what we have in the U.S., is volumes five, six, and seven. I have my volume five here in case we need to refer to it. And I have I own and have read the entire Yoshikazu Yasuhiko manga. And it is my favorite manga of all time, and I think it is probably my favorite Gundam thing overall. It is a masterpiece. We'll surely talk about that another day. But uh, just telling you, I am a Gundam The Origin fanboy, and I watched episode one last night, and I'm very excited because there's a lot to break down in this fantastic uh, piece of the Gundam universe. Yeah, and this is going to be interesting because this is this is maybe the only time on this podcast other than i guess okay well you haven't done an actual thunderbolt episode because you've also read the thunderbolt manga or at least like yes. how much of it had been put out when you had started reading it um which i have not read that and i have not finished reading the origin manga so this is a, an instance of, of you have the the student has become the master that you you know more <laughs> about this than i do Mostly because I've I have the first three volumes of the origin physically from Japan, um, and I have I have started reading it again. But I had tried to read it two times previously, and I petered out both times because I stupidly started to read it after I had just rewatched the TV show. And because it's just the story of the TV show, obviously with like modifications, and it's told in manga format, and it's like it's really good, but. Especially the last time I tried to read it was immediately after us doing the first five episodes of Mobile Suit Gundam. And I got one to two volumes in 
and was like, I just rewatched this TV show for the third time and just rewatched the movie trilogy. It was like, there's, it felt like I was doing the manga a disservice by trying to push through it, even having just like on like overdosed on Gundam stuff. Um, and it's been just long enough now that I st uh, read through basically the entire first volume just last night, like mostly expecting just to read a little bit of it before I went to bed. And then ended up staying up probably about 40 minutes more than I really intended to um, because the it grabbed me for the first time reading it has really grabbed me. Again, I think mostly just because I wasn't picking it up immediately after having watched the first episode of the TV show only a couple of weeks prior to having read the manga. Yeah, and, and the manga is closest to the anime in the early going. There's still changes early on. It does wind up deviating significantly in a lot of ways as it goes along. Um, but at the beginning, yeah, it's it's the it's obviously it's Amuro getting in the Gundam and getting up and all of that stuff. Although with the stupendous art of Mr. Yoshikazu Yasuhiko, so yeah, it's a pretty amazing thing. Yeah. So so do you want to do some some overall impressions of of because uh, again we're talking about episode one today, so we're not doing a crazy five hour podcast of trying to do all six episodes of Mobile Suit Gundam: The Origin. Um, yeah. but, but what are your thoughts? What are your feelings on, on rewatching this first episode? Just I mean, it's, speaking. it's great. And I feel very vindicated because this was my initial suggestion that, because I had been, because origin is, it's not just that I had seen it earlier, but it's one of my formative Gundam things. Uh -huh. I've been stewing on it for a long time. And especially when I reread the manga, which I will say the OVA is a very direct adaptation of those middle volumes of the manga. And I just, you know, my, my thought over and over was this stretch of story and the way it's adapted and the performances we're going to get to talk about and stuff are rich enough that I think it deserves kind of the one episode at a time treatment, which is manageable in this one in a way it's not with other Gundam shows because this isn't 50 episodes. It's six. Mm -hmm. And I do think they are all, and it's, you know, this was essentially six short movies. These were released yes. to theaters. These have not quite like Hathaway budget but they have very big Gundam budgets behind them they look great they sound great um and I think they are plenty rich enough for the six episode treatment and watching episode one again last night I wrote a bunch of notes and I thought about it and like yeah that's my main thing is that this was gonna pay off I think this is a great you know opening debut it's got fucking Mayumi Tanaka as Shara's novel I mean what more do you want um it's this first you know episode probably isn't my favorite in the whole six episode series but it is damn good, and I am very excited to break it down with you, Sean. There's stuff I have in my notes that I've wanted to talk about on this show for like three years now. It's crazy. Yeah, that's that's how I felt as well of like, it just feeling like, okay, finally we can like do a proper deep dive into the origin. Because honestly, because when I watched the origin, it was for the first time was only a little bit before we started recording Weekly Suit Gundam. Because it wrapped up in 2018. Um, because it was originally, it was only going to be four episodes. Um, and then it did so well that then they added on the Battle of Loom stuff, um, and did, it extended it out to a total of six episodes, but like that wrapped up not all that long before, um, in the grand scheme of things, we started recording Weekly Suit Gundam. So it is something that like, if it, in both feels like it has been forever since I watched Gun of the Origin. And it also feels like it was like a couple of months ago or something in a weird way that like in my Gundam life, it is the thing I did immediately before starting weekly suit Gundam, which changed the, how I think about and approach Gundam, obviously, because now it's like this big, crazy giant podcast project that we've turned it into. Um, and it's, there's like a weird sense of coming full circle or something like kind of like, it's almost like the opposite feeling of, of iron blood orphans, right. Of recording that podcast and, and going to that show, which was the last full classic style Gundam show um and now this is like you're both talking about the stuff that I think was my most fun stuff in the early goings of this podcast which was talking about Char as a character and like his psychology and what goes on with him which obviously the origin is like it is all about that it is about a deep dive into his character and like and his origin in the scope of what the the OVA adapts um but then also it is this thing of like I have wanted to rewatch this show for a very very long time and I have not done it, obviously, because I knew eventually we'd do a podcast on it. Um, and it has been very satisfying to get to, to watch that first episode again. Because also the first episode, while I agree, is not probably my favorite of the episodes. It is the most unique. It is because it is like this big deep dive into pre, like so far pre one year war that Xeon doesn't even exist for the entirety of the first episode of the OVA. 
Um, and it's like such a rare look at a specific point in time in this sort of like history in this fictional universe. Um, and there's something like so kind of rich about that, about the scope of what this episode specifically looks at. It, it is so good. And it's, you know, it's unique among stuff we've talked about so far, other than maybe Unicorn, which is the other theatrical OVA thing they've mm -hmm. done. But I remember watching Origin the first time, Sean, and I told you, I said, it kind of feels like Gundam HBO, you know, because it's like uh -huh. these big hour long episodes with a giant cast of characters and a big production budget behind it. And it does have that kind of. I, I mentioned on the Weekly Stuff podcast this week that I've started going back and watching Deadwood, which is one of the classic HBO shows. And there is kind of an affinity there. Like, it's the big hour-long, you know, big character deep dive kind of epic. Um, and it is such a cool thing to see. And yeah, this first episode, I love just how far back in the history it jumps to, um, you know, starting with the death of Zeon Zom Daikun and going on from there. Uh, it is very good stuff, and there's a ton to break down. All right, so before we get into that, though, and we do the full deep dive, let's cover some of the history of the origin Hell yeah. where this comes about. Because to do that, we'd have to go way back, because we have to go all the way back to the 1960s, because we have to really talk about the origin of anime as it exists, because <laughs> we need to talk about Yoshikazu Yasuhiko. Yes, we do. Um, so Yoshikazu Yasuhiko, who is the obviously the mangaka for Gundam The Origin, is the they call chief director the origin has basically two directors i'll talk about that split but he's basically the overall director of the ova project um and then he was of course the original character designer and an animation director working on the original mobile suit gundam um back in 1979 but his history with anime starts basically the same way that it did with yoshiki tomino so he worked at mushi productions um as a storyboard artist which was the was osamu tezuka who was the kind of like the father of modern manga in anime. He's the creator of Astro Boy. Um, like basically without him, ma like manga and anime would not exist in the way that it exists. Yeah, Tezuka um, and Mushi Pro figured out basically the, for good and for ill, the economics yeah. of doing weekly anime on television in the 60s, which is the model that to a certain degree continues to today. Yeah, absolutely. And so... Yasiko started at that studio as a storyboard artist, which is also where Tomino got his start in the business as well. Because, I mean, you can't really get a start in the business in almost any way before that point, because there's almost no animation that exists in certainly like the modern history of Japan before that point. You'd actually have to go kind of almost like like to the war or pre-war to get something that's not The only bad. thing is the 50s is, is Toei Doga and their feature division. Mushi Pro is the first of the TV division. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's where they get their start. They work on a couple of projects back then, although it's one of those things where some of those projects, it's hard to get like accurate credits um, for some of that stuff, particularly if you're someone that's like so far low on the totem pole, like Tomino and Yasika. But they almost certainly worked on multiple projects together um, at Muchi Pro. One that we do know they, they worked on is in 1971. They both worked on a show called The Wandering Sun. Um, that's Sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N. Uh, Wandering Sun, S-O-N is a very different show in 2010. <laughs> um, but in 1971, they work on the show Wandering Sun together. Um, and then shortly after that point is when uh, Mushi Pro starts to dissolve because it basically goes bankrupt. And in 1972, a bunch of ex-Mushi production people left the studio to start a new studio called Sunrise. Amongst the people who left was, of course, Yoshiki Tomino and Yoshikazu Yasuhiko. And at Sunrise, they worked on multiple projects together. Most notably, in 1975, they worked on a show called Riding the Brave which is a super robot show, which is one of Tobino's first directing jobs. He directed the first half of that series. And in that series, Yoshikazu Yasuhiko served as a character designer and as one of the animation directors, basically the same roles that he served on Gundam. Um, and so that's kind of where you can see a lot of their working partnership begin at Sunrise. And then in 1979, of course, um, they start, or 1978, they start work on the Gundam that airs in 1979. Um, Tomino directs the show and he brings on Yoshikazu Yasuhiko at the same role that they had worked on in writing The Brave. Um, who So he was a character designer. But I think sometimes you just get people say like, oh, he was the character designer and that's it. And that's not it on uh, Mobile Suit Gundam. Like other than Tomino, he's almost certainly like the most important creative person behind the scenes working on the original Gundam. Um, he did end up collapsing due to um, overwork because he also worked on... Um, all basically the Space Battleship Yamato series. Um, that's like another thing that Yasuhiko is very famous for in animation. 
Um, and so for the last third or so of Mobile Suit Gundam, uh, Yasuhiko was kind of out of commission because he was in the hospital. Um, but he did come back and kind of um, help put a cap on Gundam because he also worked on the movie trilogy. Um, but again, he was not just a character designer. Um, he, he did a huge amount of stuff. Like when you look at the um, Wikipedia entry for him, they, like, they kind of they call him basically like a cleaner um, on that show that like he just kind of came up in on whatever kind of capacity they needed additional work. He would kind of do cleanup work on animation, on art design, on some script stuff, on direction, right? Because he was an animation director. So that means that he directed some of the episodes as well. Um, and so he did a huge amount of work on that original Mobile Suit Gundam, which is one of the things that then I think you can very much see how close that attachment is and his knowledge and affinity for it when you get to the origin manga. Um, after 1979 and after Mobile Suit Gundam, his relationship to the Gundam franchise is like kind of in fits and spurts. He does do some character design work. He does the character design work for Zeta Gundam. He does it for um, F91. Um, but for most of the 80s, Yasuhiko's um, career in animation is very kind of up and down. And I've read a bunch of uh, interviews with him where he kind of describes the period of the 80s as this period where he really wanted to get out of animation but couldn't really figure out how to do it because it kind of a lot of things were not working out for him in that way. So he did work on a bunch of projects. Uh, one of the more notable ones um, that I do really want to watch because it's on Crunchyroll is called Giant Gorg. Um, which is a big mecha series that came out in 1985. One thing that's interesting about that is that Mayumi Tanaka plays the main character in Giant Gorg, and they cast oh, her interesting. as Castfall. Um, and I know that she worked on another thing. I forget what it is, but she worked on another uh, Yasuhiko project. And so I suspect that, that she maybe was cast like kind of very deliberately because Yasuhiko would have worked with her before. Um, he worked on a couple of movies um, based on manga that he made in the 80s and stuff like that, but not much that really kind of picked up and, and took off. And so uh, he basically kind of quit the animation business and for the entirety of the 90s, outside of a couple of things like doing character design on F91, which on F91, it was purely just character design. He didn't work on anything else on that series. Um, he became a mangaka. So he drew and wrote mostly historical nonfiction type manga. Like some of his most famous ones are Joan, based on Joan of Arc, and Jesus, based on Jesus Christ. Um, but he found a lot of success in the 90s and a lot of popularity in the manga space um, as mangaka writing these kind of fairly unique um, historical manga. Um, and at the end of the 90s, the CEO at the time um, at Sunrise, who was um, Eiji Yamauda, um, or no, so Eiji Yamauda kind of started the project, but mostly it was Takeuki Yoshi, who took over from Yamaura around 2000, started talks with Yoshikazu Yasuhiko to do an adaptation of the original Mobile Suit Gundam in manga form. And then eventually Yasuhiko agreed. The scope of the project was originally going to be a lot smaller than it ended up being, because the overall thing is in its original Tankoban release format, um, not the sort of like the Isobon or the perfect editions that we got over here. It was 23 volumes, um, which is a big sizable manga released over the course of 10 years. It was going to be a smaller, more close adaptation of the original series. Um, but as it went on, the origin was very, very popular and it sold extremely well. And Yoshikazu Yasuhiko seems to have really enjoyed it. Um, if you read interviews with him, he, he talks very, very fondly about his work on the origin. And so he expanded the scope of it out including very notably these long um, chapters detailing the history and background of Shar and Sela, which is, of course, then the root of where the origin of Ye's come from. Near the end of the run of the manga is when they start getting discussions about a potential anime adaptation, um, and that kind of spins around in a lot of different ideas about what that would eventually look like, and then they ultimately settle on this kind of movie OVA-esque, like Unicorn Gundam kind of format, um, to adapt the flashback material um, instead of trying to do like a remake of the original Mobile Suit Gundam, which is something that they considered at the time. Um, but they moved to this OVA format. Again, as I said earlier, they originally planned on doing just the four of them, um, but then they ended up extending it out to a full six, basically adapting all that material. And for that, Yoshikazu Yasuhiko served as chief director. Um, and as far as I can tell, what that entails is that he was mostly working from home, um, and like, you know, on like phone calls and conferences and stuff like that from home, but having materials from the series sent to him and he would do checks and make comments and, and work 
in a kind of like broad overview format. And then the day-to-day -day directorial duties at the studio were handled by Takashi Imanishi, who is someone that we know as the main director of the MS Igloo series. So he was the director of MS Igloo 1 and 2. So both the kind of like bad but weird museum pieces of 1 and the really kick-ass MS Igloo 2. Um, and I think you could see that influence like very, very clearly. I mean, some of it obviously in the fact that they made the choice to go full 3D CG animation, which is a lot more advanced in 2015 than it was in 2005. So the 3D CG for the mobile suits, uh, which is what they did, looks way better here than the 3D CG did uh, for this weird like PS2 era fucking uh, museum thing that they did in 2005 with MS Igloo 1. Um, but so Imanishi was the kind of hands-on director in the studio. Yuzu Kazuyasuhiko did the broad overview. And then the staff, the rest of the staff, as is true of a lot of stuff in 2010's Gundam, is just like everybody is some sort of like veteran in the industry. Um, it's a lot like if you look into the most of the people that worked on shows like G-Reco, you just like click in and it's, and it's people that are like at a relatively minor role in the show still have careers that go back to them like doing significant work on Double Zeta and Victory Gundam and stuff like that, um, which is a thing that Yasiko talked about in interviews that I saw. One of the reasons he really enjoyed working on the OVAs and his kind of return to animation was this feeling of everybody he was working with or most of the people he was working with were veterans that knew what the fuck they were doing, which Sunrise for these kind of Gundam projects has the leeway to be able to do in this period. Um, and rather than in the 80s, everyone he was working with was someone brand new, right? Because it was the new generation coming up into animation who kind of fell in love with it through the stuff that a lot of the stuff that Yasiko worked on in the 70s. Um, and I think that's like a cool part of these projects is seeing how much like episode directors, animation directors, storyboard artists, art directors, all are people who have a lot of connection to the franchise going back um, multiple decades. So he works on uh, the origin. We have our six episodes and uh, and luckily Yoshikazu Yasuhiko has enjoyed the experience so much that we do, of course, as we talked about on the podcast before, they've announced that they're doing a Kukuru's Doan's Island movie um, that Yoshikazu Yasuhiko is the director for. I think, the and as I said at the time, and the more I've read interviews with him, the more convinced I am that the only reason that movie is happening is entirely because Yoshikazu Yasuhiko just wants to direct a fucking movie again because he really enjoyed doing <laughs> these OVAs. And so they're like, well, sure. We'll have yeah. like, like, yeah, if you want to direct a movie, here you go. Let's do it. And, um, and specifically the Kukuru's Doan's Island thing, that is not in the origin manga. He skips that story. But a separate mangaka did do a spin-off manga of the origin, sort of in Yasuhiko's style, in the Gundam Ace magazine. And that's what this is based on. So it is part of the overall origin sort of au revoir. Yes. Um, and it's... it's it's something that I, I spent a lot of time over the past week reading a lot of interviews with them. I highly recommend people do the same because there's a lot of good translated interviews out there. Like if you just type his name into Google and, and put an interview, you'll find a bunch of stuff. Um, and it's really, it's a, it's a very interesting career arc of like how down on animation he's, he is when he talks about like his experience in the anime industry in the 80s and then how much fun it sounds like he had doing the origin and it's like it's just n nice to have someone who has this like very long historic career in anime but who never really got the kind of same level of prominence and general success as you know certainly someone like Yoshiki Tomino um but has deserved it just as much but just you know a lot of things didn't work out in the 80s um and then it, kind of having this more happy ending of him coming back this later stage in his career and finding a lot of like success and joy in working on this stuff. And he specifically uses the word manzoku or satisfaction of him saying that like the stuff he worked on in the eighties didn't sort of satisfy or fulfill him as an artist. And he feels fulfilled by working on the origin. And it's a, it's a very nice feeling. And I think it's something that is transmitted through both the manga and these OVAs is this sense of like an artist at the height of their craft getting to tell a story that they're very enthusiastic and passionate about telling that is revisiting something from earlier in their career. Um, and it's something that, you know, you get with a lot of Tomino's stuff because he's very self-reflective in his later Gundams like Turn A and G Reco. But this is a similar kind of self-reflective artist, but someone whose touchstone for Gundam is almost entirely just his work on first Gundam because that is the thing that he really was heavily involved in and cared about a lot. Yeah, and you know, I can I talk about the manga a little bit and like yeah. where this all comes because the other thing to say is that you know by the time he came back to do the manga, you know, despite having you know this checkered history in animation, he is one of the most respected people in the entire industry, yeah. 
And mm-hmm. so, like, the, the Isobahn, the perfect editions that we have here in the U.S., um, each have essays in the back of the books by various people. Like, the first one has Hideaki Anno. A later one has the uh, Makoto Shinkai, the director of Your Name, writes about it and does a little interview with Yasuhiko. And so all these respected, like, people who are generations lower than Yasuhiko come in and just talk about, like, his impact on them and then also their love of this manga. Because this manga was not just popular, it was also immensely acclaimed and still is to this yeah. day. Like, when I give my praise for the manga, I'm not on an island on that. That is very much, like, everyone who's read it agrees it's kind of a revelatory work. And, like, you know, you talked about how it maybe started with a shorter... Um, sense of scope and expand it out but you can feel that from the opening chapters because he takes about 200 pages to do like the first episode of Gundam like he really like broadens it and like luxuriates in it and it is very different you know a lot of popular anime have manga adaptations that is a very common thing there's a million manga magazines in Japan promotional manga are very common and most of them I mean, are not i would say it's probably hard to find an anime that doesn't have a manga adaptation like an original anime series and find yes. one that didn't ever get adapted to manga in any form like that almost doesn't exist right um and but most of them are not particularly notable they don't usually yeah. get translated outside of japan they're little promotional things sometimes you will get like the authors of promotional manga that'll be a stepping stone and then they'll come out and you know do bigger stuff that's like the dragon ball super manga is an interesting case where the person who did that had been doing a promotional manga for super dragon ball heroes and then dragon ball super started as a promotional manga and is now just a full manga um sometimes you'll have stuff like that but there's plenty of promotional manga this is not a promotional manga this is like honestly the work i would compare this closest to that people might have read is miyazaki's nausicaa manga where it is like this sort of like master artist but you are seeing just their work right on the page just from their head just from their hand it's not filtered through like the anime machine where you need a lot more people to do it um it is a very passionate work of art that i think makes a lot of smart updates and changes to the original source material it's just a beautiful thing um and i wanted to read here because i think it's a good like intro to all of this one of the essays in the back of volume one is from shinichiro inoue who was the president of kadokawa shoten the publishing arm that that put this manga out and it's just a little page here about the birth of the the origin manga that i really love so i wanted to read a little bit of this um yoshikazu yasuhiko is willing to draw a manga of first gundam It was near the end of 2000, I recall, when Sunrise proposed this sensational plan. Mr. Yasuhiko was a grandmaster of original works as a manga artist by then. My sense was that he maintained a distance from the anime industry. My belief that he approached Gundam-related projects with caution. When the unexpected offer came, it was a fantastic surprise, and I remember the churn of excitement like it was yesterday. Behind the scenes of that proposal were Sunrise's plans to expand the North American market for the Gundam franchise. For the linchpin of that operation, they needed a manga by Mr. Yasuhiko, but I personally tabled such concerns as secondary, overwhelmed by how badly I wanted to read it, and roused by my sense of a mission as an editor to obtain the manuscript for our company. When I received the storyboards from Sunrise, they went up through the end of Garma, that is, the scene in which Sovereign Degwin hears of Garma's death and drops his scepter. The moment I finished reading, I had goosebumps. This was no simple rehashing of the anime version, but a retelling in which the subtleties of Mr. Yasuhiko's characterization and storytelling style, honed in his historical manga, fed back into the world of Gundam with a brilliantly struck balance. That was the exact moment I felt certain that this work would open up new possibilities without fail. It was Mr. Yasuhiko's request that each installment of the serialization consist of about a hundred pages. To accommodate this, I immediately decided to start up an exclusive Gundam manga magazine. Dissenting opinions from within our firm, could we really issue a periodical based on one property, were summarily suppressed by the success of Gundam Ace. Mr. Yasuhiko's manga single-handedly catalyzed an explosive response from fans who had reacted coolly to fervent 20th anniversary promotions. It segued into the subsequent Gundam revival and the popularity of Seed. Incidentally, incidentally, the audacity of naming the work fell upon me. I had origin in the back of my mind as a name for the protagonist of a hero manga I wanted to see created someday, but I didn't think I'd ever get the chance to use it, and the origin was kindly adopted as the title for the Yasuhiko Gundam. The fact that Mr. Yasuhiko, Yasuhiko liked it himself was, for me, the greatest joy. I think that's a really good summary of the history you've been giving us, Sean. And also the just like, can you imagine being in the publishing office getting the note like, hey, Yoshikazu Yasuhiko wants to draw a Gundam manga and you get to edit it. (laughs) That is such a cool idea. Um, And, you know, one of the notes that Inoue makes there that I think is very true is he mentions how it feels like 
all of Yasuhiko's work on historical manga, because he's made all these very acclaimed historical manga, like the Joan of Arc thing and the Jesus Christ thing, kind of fed back into Gundam. And that is one of the ways I would describe the manga for those who haven't read it, is it kind of feels like Gundam filtered through the view of someone who is very historically minded and is used to telling stories with a historical bent. And that particularly comes into play in the origin arc, in the flashback arc that is then adapted for this OVA. There's a real sense of historicity here. There's a lot of, I think, historical analogs to real world Earth stuff in how he characterizes like the Zabi family's rise to power. Um, and all of it just feels like there is a much greater attention to detail, the kind of attention to detail you can kind of only do in a manga mm -hmm. to all of the little details of the story and how they feed together to create a version of the world building that is so tight and historically minded. Because I think another part of the missive of this project is it kind of combines all the different versions of First Gundam we've had. The movies and the show and a lot of the original novelization by Tomino is taken for the flashback arc and for a lot of other things. And it kind of creates this big sort of final version of the story. It also takes influences from like Char's Counterattack and Zeta and Double Zeta and puts some of those things in the original manga. Um, but it is a fan-fucking-tastic manga. And I think it is also important just... And I'll make notes about this without going too overboard with it as we're going along. But the OVA is great. But it is important to note that, like, the flashback is not just a disconnected thing from the manga. It happens in the middle of the series. But it happens at the place it happens for a very specific reason. And a lot of the things that Yasuhiko does with the characters in the flashbacks is because of things he does with them in the manga that are different than in the show. Particularly for Char. Um... There's a lot of, like, Char is basically elevated to co-lead of the manga alongside Amuro. I would say it's sort of a, I don't know if I would say it's a dual protagonist structure, because Char is actually even sh more sharply the antagonist of the manga. But it is like the antagonist is an equal co-lead, sort of. Mm -hmm. um, and so the flashback has a lot of influence in on that. Um, and so, you know, there's always been people sort of clamoring for, well, what if they remade all of First Gundam in the style of this OVA? And I don't know if I need that, but it would be cool because there is sort of a context to it that's also important in the body of the manga. So that's just my sort of opening note as we talk about the history here. Yes, I mean a a full if they if they tried to adapt Gun of the Origin into a full series, that would be an incredibly expensive undertaking because it's like it is again, it would be huge. it's not a short manga. It's no. twenty three volumes. Like it's basically the same size as the entirety of Kimetsu Yaiba. Um, yeah, it's yeah, like it's a it's a it is a. I mean, it took him ten years. Um, it, it wasn't like a slow like trickle over the course of ten years. Like that's a ten year project. Yeah, and I um, should say like the. The flashback that they adapt for these, again, six hours of OVA, that's only three of the 12 volumes of the yep. Perfect Edition. It's only a quarter of the series. So, yes, it's uh, honestly, it is an extended version of Gundam. Like, if you were to do it in a TV anime, I think you'd need more than 43 episodes. Like, it's big. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, where, so, so I think that's, that's covers our kind of like overall kind of history and, and where we come from to get to. Um, 2015 this first episode coming out so how do you want to tackle talking about um mobile suit gundam the origin one the blue-eyed castle yeah um i mean we should we just start with our boy the blue-eyed castle um because it you know this episode and the origin overall very much positions i would say castle as the protagonist and sela as the deuteragonist as kind of our two mm -hmm. main leads of the show um this first episode slightly less so because they are kids and so there's a lot of adults who are doing exciting stuff on the sides but they are sort of our main figures here um and for the first time in japanese someone other than shuichi ikeda is voicing char in this one uh except for the opening little prologue thing um so do you want to start by talking about those characters and how they come into things yeah, because I think one thing that's interesting is uh, I didn't remember that Castle doesn't say anything for the entire first half of this episode, basically. Yes. It's like 25 minutes or so before um, Mayumi Tanaka, um, who voices Castle here, has a single line of dialogue. Because it's not until Cassilia comes to Jim Burrell's manor um, and asks to see him. Like, obviously, there are some, like, grunts and, like, kind of fill-in noises that Castle right. does. Um, but there are no actual lines of dialogue. And it's a it's a really interesting choice in this first episode because, as you say, 
this origin, like sort of taking out this story, this kind of big flashback and telling it as its own thing that in this format is disassociated from the broader context of First Gundam. Um, it is making Char the sort of protagonist character, the, the character that the story is about, marking his change in how he kind of navigates this era of political upheaval that he is in the midst of, beginning with, at the beginning of this episode, the death of his father, Zion Zim Daikun. Um, but in this first episode, he's he's kind of like this presence on the side of events who is just watching and listening as things happen. And he only really directly interacts with it in a couple of scenes, most notably at the end when he takes control of the gun tank and, and kills like a couple dozen people basically by shooting down multiple other gun tanks as a like 10 year old kid. Um, but for this episode, there's just such an attention to watching him listening and watching things instead of having him being an active character that is proactively doing things in the story because he's so young that he is not yet in the position to be able to do it. Yeah. And you know, this is something that very much comes from the manga because one of the reasons why the origin manga is as long as it is, is how much of the manga is Yasuhiko drawing characters faces and just showing them observing and reacting and you can very much tell that this is a guy who was a character designer once you know and like that mm -hmm. was his like stock in trade and, and like, animation director that, and like, animation, I think both yeah. of those things like come across very strongly in how he he draws his manga Yes, absolutely. Be, and, and so he has an attention to the detail of characters and just he can do with minor little pen strokes what I think a lot of mangaka and animation directors would take quite a bit more to express. Like, you know, in the manga, and it's, it's and a lot of this is adapted for the anime, but there's stuff like, you know, Kaecilia kills Sasuro in this episode. And it's yeah. very clear she kills Sasuro Zabi. Not because anyone, because we have, it stops and like it turns to black and she like rubs her hands and goes, ha ha, Sasuro is dead. It's because in the manga, there's a couple of cutaways to her face and with a tiny little like stroke of the pen, Yasuhiko on that face reveals like what her intentions are and that is taken over to the episode. And there's a lot of that here, I think, with, with Casfall as well. Um, we should call him Casfall because one of the things I like the credits do is they specifically credit Mayumi Tanaka as Casfall and they credit Shuichi Keita as Shar. And I think that's a good split in how to think about them. <laughs> um, but yes. Um, so yeah, I think that is the fascinating thing here, Sean. And... I think something I love about the origin overall as a prequel is it is so attuned to character psychology, best of all with Char, but it's true with everyone. And it's constantly thinking about their history as it will relate to future turns in the plot. So, you know, so much of this episode is, as you say, Casval watching and reacting and a lot of times seething because he is mm -hmm. angry about a lot of different things and a lot of his thoughts are sort of open to interpretation but he is this kid who has this anger bubbling up inside him and we are watching that over the course of this episode um but you know it's not just influences from the manga i think as an anime production there are so many things that bring it to life here. There's the animation, obviously. There's the vocal performance, which we're going to talk about. But there's also the music. I think the score to the origin is one of my favorite Gundam scores, particularly for the main theme for Char that is here. That I had to note here because I've there's a version of it that plays, I think, in episode five, the Battle of Loom episode, that is called the Red Comet of Loom. It's on the soundtrack. I've listened to it a million times. And I noticed that it is seeded throughout this episode. You first hear it in, this episode opens with a sort of in medias res opening to the Battle of Loom. And you hear a version of it there. It's this big triumphant Red Comet theme. But you hear it several times in the past. It's first introduced in that flash forward opening, but then it gets its first full expression when Char and Sailor, or Casval and Artesia are in the tank waving goodbye to their mom. And mm -hmm. it's this sad, mournful kind of dirge version of the theme. And you also hear it when the cargo bay opens at the very end and the ship is leaving with um, Casval and, and Artesia first going out into space and seeing the world. You hear a version of it. And so even in this first episode, what the score is doing is connecting the fire and passion that Shara's novel has in battle to the pain and grief of separation and loss from his mother and home that Casval has as a child. And that is a major theme in this entire story. It's one of the major reasons why the flashback is structured as it is, because there's more about Shar's mommy issues, frankly, in the manga that is kind of brought 
back into first Gundam from Shar's counterattack and Zeta Gundam and some of that stuff. And I think there's so many elements of the production that are so smart about that. And the music is one that really strikes me. Yeah, yeah. I think across the board, Takeyuki Hattori, who's the composer, does a great job in, in particular. I'm with you. That it's it's that main theme, the sort of Shar theme, and it's and its variations um, throughout the series is so good. And yeah, particularly at the end of this episode, um, I like the the connection you you see there um, of, of that the the episode is bookended by these two different interpretations or like uses of that core theme. Um, because yes, throughout this episode, um, so much of it is like I think about Castle's mommy issues, right? It's so much about his feeling of like abandonment that even when he's with her he's not really with her like there's a lot of great scenes and shots of all three of them together Caswell, Artesia, and their mother um but her mother is like caring about or like like thinking about or talking to Artesia and Castle is like on the sidelines watching or listening and the most I think like striking image of that is their last night together in the tower all three of them in the bed Artesia and the mother like embracing and her comforting Artesia and telling her about like the moon and all that kind of stuff um and then but then on the side on the other side is Caspel with his back turned and there's a close-up shot of him um just sort of like glaring because he knows and understands actually what's happening because he's older and he's also you know he's Char right he's this is our little sociopath in the making um he's identified exactly everything that's happening but he doesn't know how to express it and nobody is talking to or like trying to console him through those experiences um and there's a just a lot of that of you seeing these moments of him not having anybody there for him really like he, he's even when he's with other characters he's, he seems so alone in this story as everything else is like spiraling out of control around him and he's kind of sort of expected in this weird broad sense as like the heir of Zianzum Daikun and he kind of puts this on himself in the scene with Kaecilia to be the one who's in charge and kind of figured this all out. Yeah. It is such a fascinating character to study in the beginning here because he is, you know, because this, this episode also frames itself as like this major moment in history, right? You know, mm -hmm. this is the death of Zianzum Daikun and the, you know, fallout of it afterwards. This is basically, you know, and I, I love the way, and I've always loved this about how Yasuhiko characterizes this, is that we'll talk about, like, did the Zeons actually kill Zeon, or did the Zabis kill Zianzum Daikun, which I think the origin comes down pretty hard on the they didn't side. And, but what it does is it portrays it like basically the death of Lenin in the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. which is like this sort of sudden death of the revolutionary leader who actually believed in the ideals. And then there is this, you know, greasy politician who was very good at grease in the wheels, who is on the side, who comes in and takes over and makes everything, in, you know, infin infinitely worse. And that is the Zabi family, right? Who are basically the mm -hmm. Stalin analogs here. But it is this major moment of upheaval. And so it feels like it has this very real historical grounding. And there is the kid who is in the middle of it, who seems to kind of understand what moment he's in. And that is part of what makes Shar Shar, is that he kind of sees the wheels of time in motion, you know? Yeah, and and but is so powerless to do anything about it right yes. now. Yes, until until he gets in a fucking gun tank. <laughs> yes, it, until he does get power, then he starts murdering people, which is pretty much what Char always does. <laughs> yes, it's the only time he's happy is when he can be in a big robot and kill people, and it's like that's where he's like, I like. If only, like, what they need is, is, like, have him put on a pair of sunglasses when he fucking grabs the, they, like, rip off the sleeves of his shirt, put on some sunglasses, <laughs> and it's like, there you go. This is the life that you want to leave, Castle, leave Castle. This is what, this is, like, what you should become. Should we talk about who they cast as Castle yeah. Rem Daikun? Because, you know, it's a big task. He has always been Shuichi Keda in Japanese. Oh no, we have a little kid. Shuichi Keda, it would be funny to hear him voice little little Char, but it wouldn't sound right. So we need to cast someone. If you're gonna recast Char, let's pick a legend among legends. I mean, Sean, I've been thinking about this. Is there a Japanese voice actor with a more storied career than Mayumi fucking Tanaka? I mean, the, the, you'd have to go... Like, the only other ones, like, in the same category would be people like Masako Nozawa, who, yes. I mean, she started as, like, a child actress. 
you know, yeah. or like Toto Fudi as the voice actor for Amro, um, the same thing. Like, I mean, because you're, because this is like that generation of like, kind of the, one of the original generation of actors, um, but specifically with Mayumi Tanaka, um, like the biggest thing is Luffy, right? So she's right. Luffy in One Piece. She's also Krillin um, in Dragon Ball, um, as well as, I mean, a million things. It's one of those actors that's like, it feels almost stupid to try to identify individual roles that Mayumi Tanaka has played. Um, because there's, there's I, I, too many. I mean, my point about her storied career is yeah. that, like, Luffy, it, it's so funny to say this, if Luffy never came along, she would still be one of the yes. biggest voice actors in Japanese history. You know, like, her, she is in a bunch of, like, 70s series. She's starting to get leads by then, uh, and in the early 80s and stuff. But, like, she is the lead in Laputa, Castle in the Sky, the Miyazaki movie, which is, like people in america like that movie that is one of the most beloved movies in japanese history so that's a very big role you know she then is immediately in dragon ball in a bunch of roles she's crudit in but she's also yajirobe and baba and and has a lot of background roles um and there's just so much stuff through all of that and then at the end of the 90s gets luffy and it's like you know it is just one of those careers where when i think you trace like the early stuff to the late stuff it's crazy and you know she is there from yeah her first role is in 78 and then she's in a bunch of stuff through the 80s and 90s. And it's just, it is a, a pretty crazy career. Um, and she is also just ludicrously talented. <laughs> yeah, and I think it was probably pretty key here that they cast someone who has, like, worked with Shuji Ikeda, right? Because they're from the same yeah. generation of actors. Um, and so there's a thing here with Maimi Tanaka's performance that I think is so key that she is doing the Char, like, in, in Shuchi Keita cadence and the intonation, like the, those elements are there, which are so iconic, right? Like Char is one of those characters that like, you know, um, that like Japanese people will do impressions of because like the way he talks is so distinctive. You know, it's like how anyone can do an impression of like Darth Vader or something like that. You know, it's just such an iconic voice that's so particular. And so when you need to get someone else to do it, you need to capture some of those like key elements of the character's intonation and in, in cadence because it's a, you know, it's a defining element of the character, but there's also this distinct danger of that, of it just sounding like someone doing an impression of Char and like do it, like overdoing it, right? Leaning too much into the unique, like cadence and intonation of the character that's like a little bit sort of eccentric for Char. And if you leaned into it too hard, I think it would sound very silly. Um, in Mimi Tanaka, there's just this very, very studied approach to just getting the hints of that stuff. It's definitely there if you're listening to it um, and you're like, and you're listening to it and thinking of it as Char and you can identify those elements, but it's never something that is like a parody of that kind of performance. And it's such a fine line that I think Mayu Tanaka finds the exact like spot to, to sit on of capturing the essence of the character without ever going too far with it and making it seem silly, like silly or parodic of this like very iconic performance. I think the key moment for that is the the first scene where Char has significant dialogue in this episode, um, which is Casval's encounter with Kaecilia Zabi, when Kaecilia comes in basically to put the screws to this kid and like see if he's going to break, and he doesn't break. But it's such an interesting version of it because it is a Casval who is sort of in over his head and is sort of feeling out how to encounter someone like this. Um, and it is just, it is a stupendous scene. It is a knockout, like, classic moment from this or any other Gundam episode. Yeah, exactly. And, and it is, it's the most, you know, char shit in the world that this, like, adult woman is, like, threatening his life. And he doesn't fucking care. Like, he's, yeah. like, what are you to me? Um, is his whole attitude and, you know, the fact that he just is completely unthreatened by this woman. Um, it is, it is char to a t char to a t and i love how it's exactly what you say about mayumi tanaka you can you can hear both the child in the voice and the man this child is going to become right um you know i would not be surprised if she and shuichi ikeda had like conversations behind the scenes about how to do this you know it's very mm -hmm. it's so well done um but, you know, I think the key Char moment in the entire episode, Sean, is there's the scene in the tank when, I mean, one, I do love the entire sort of tank finale of this. It is, we will talk about Hamon because Hamon is fucking great in this. She's also yep. voiced by your girl, Miyuki Suashiro, yes. um, in a very My good queen, please. My queen. Your, your queen. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, not your girl. She, she's not yours. She's not anyone's girl. She's the world's. Yeah, way too familiar. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly. 
Pretty yeah, well. your queen playing Crowley Hamon, who I love that her plan, and it is brilliant, is like, what's the best way to smuggle this kid to the cargo bay? Well, why don't we do the thing they will least expect, which is run a gun tank down Main Street, yep. right? Um, and of course, uh, Casfall and Sela, or Casfall and Artesia wind up in the top of the thing where they have the controls of the guns and everything. Um, and I think, to me, Sean, there are three Rosetta Stone moments for Sharaz novel in the history of Gundam. There is, I have never betrayed anyone ever, Haman. Uh-huh. There is, she could have been a mother to me from the end of Shara's counterattack. And then there is this, where Sela says, who is that? And he replies, Tekida, the enemy, my enemy, your enemy, mother's enemy, everyone, I'll take them out. And then he starts firing. And I think the choice in Yasuhiko's story to give Shar something of a Gundam Boy origin story, this primal moment where he is in a mobile suit against impossible odds and goes wild, but to do it in a very Shar Osnabel-esque way, and to have him have that line of like, what is his vision of the world when he has his finger on a trigger? It is that that's everyone's enemy. To me, that is one of the three primal, most important Rosetta Stone Shara's novel moments. Mayumi Tanaka delivers it with aplomb. I think the direction of the anime in that scene is phenomenal. Um, it, it captures Yos- Yasuhiko's art style in those moments from the manga so perfectly. It is the send chills down your spine moment of this first episode, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Because it is the thing, as you say, that it's it's like... Because it is his, like, Amro Gundam boy, like, everything is going to shit. I, like, gotta do this. I gotta take care of this kind of moment and be getting handed, like, the world's biggest weapon to try to solve this problem. But, of course, like, when Amro is given that scenario, his, like, main concern is protecting people, right? Like, the reason why he's defeating these Zakus is to save people. It's why it's so key, and this is a moment that also the origin manga does in, in the original show, where he destroys, Amuro destroys that first Zaku, fucks up, hits its core, it explodes, ends up, you know, sending his dad out into space, all that stuff, <laughs> and like, potentially could have destroyed, and if another one blows up, could destroy the entire colony. So he has to make the deliberate choice of killing only the cockpit and destroying the cockpit and only just killing the person of the second Zaku to make sure it doesn't explode. But that's because he cares about saving these people and protecting this colony. Like that's what he is fighting for fundamentally. Um, and that's why he can't just let this fucking thing blow up. Whereas for Caspel, if those things had had caused a giant nuclear explosion, he wouldn't have given a fuck. Like he wouldn't have cared. Like unless they were near the tower where his mother lived. Like other than that, he doesn't care about the rest of this stuff. Um, and I think there's, there's, something of that in his mindset if he is so easily able to just identify these people as the enemy even though one thing is they're not the fucking zombies who he believes kills his killed his father they're just random federation soldiers like this isn't some like i'm getting revenge for my dad this is they're just the enemies because they're standing in my way there's he doesn't express some sort of like ideological belief against them or anything like that it's just we got to get out of here they're threatening us, so they are the enemy, and I'll just take them out whatever means necessary. That, to me, is why it's a Rosetta Stone moment for the life of Shara's novel. Yeah. is because this is not a guy... Because here's the thing, Sean. I will argue throughout these episodes that I think the origin's interpretation of Shar is that he does not try to get revenge on the zombies for his dad. I think he tries to get revenge on them for his mom. Because what they do to his mom, we'll see this in the next episode, is much worse. And... Yeah. And I think it is, and I also think that because of that, I think it is more about the mom than it is about the dad. It is harder to pin an enemy on that. And I think Char's anger is so much less at any one person. If he really was like, you know, you know, dead to the wall, like the zombies are the evil ones, there's a lot of ways he could have gone about that more smoothly in First Gundam, right? If he just, that was his mm-hmm. prime source of anger. I think there is a much bigger pathology to Shara's novel that is about an anger at the world and the systems and just the entire, all of the things that make him hurt and confused inside in ways he doesn't understand. So he starts shooting shit, right? And I yeah. think that is why that moment is so key. And it's it's a thing that Yasuhiko is going to hit on a lot in this, this big flashback arc that becomes the OVA 
is these primal moments that that link to stuff that we understand from ex- the existing Gundam canon, and I think that is just one of the the key, most key moments of that is they're all our enemy, and I'm gonna blow them the fuck up. That is the mindset of someone whose life will on the other side end trying to send an asteroid down to destroy the Earth. You know? Yeah, that that in many ways like Shard needs to feel powerful and needs to feel in control, right? Like that's part of where his rivalry with Amro comes from is that Amro is the only person who's consistently able to beat him that he has ever yeah. met basically in his entire life um because fundamentally Amro and Shard broadly speaking believe in the exact same things. Um Yes. Yeah, it's yeah, and and it is this thing of where um it is very fascinating to watch this episode and see like just those kinds of little moments in those little details that are so carefully chosen um that fit perfectly into this broader tapestry of this character that spanned you know this entire two whole tv shows and this movie from like basically 20 years before this thing before like the origin came out you know um, yeah so do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Sela, who is not as big a presence in this episode, um, but is a adorable presence? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Artesia in this episode is the like need to comic relief kind of thing. I mean, she's not like comic in that she's very funny, but it's comic more and just like it's happy and it's light until it's not obviously at the end. And then it's super fucking depressing. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I was going to say, Sean, episode... I'm thinking of like the moon at the end and like, yeah, it's so fucked up. <laughs> But for most of the red time of this episode, it's like Artesia being this happy little girl running around with her pet cat named Lucifer um, and in her like relationship with Ramba and all of that. Like she's so completely adorable um, that it is it is this like one thing that you get this one like moment of levity um, throughout all this like awful shit that is happening to these people. You know, like one of my favorite moments in this episode is her asking Ramba Rao to go yes. back and get Lucifer. And this is just a little kind of funny little bit with a great punchline of her saying, oops, I forgot to tell him that Lucifer scratches anyone that he doesn't know. And then the mom just kind of basically face palms in the yes. window as Ramba Rao drives away. Um, it's so next good. Time you see him, his face is covered in cat scratches. Um, like that element is like, it's like, it's a very important, like part of the kind of the tonal variety of this thing that it is not just darkness and sadness. Like, it's one of the things that you need Artesia slash Sela there as a contrast to Caswell and Char because she goes through the same experiences that he went through, but she lives her life and interprets them in very different ways than he does. Um, and, and you see, you know, it doesn't go into detail with that stuff yet because she's so young, but you see, like, the seeds of that kind of, like, duality being planted here. You know, and I think, you know, a lot of the the stuff they do with Sela in this stretch, of the, in the six-episode origin is attuned to in the manga Sela's role is expanded particularly in the mm-hmm. back half of Gundam which I think is is an unalloyed good it, it helps the story a lot and I think you know you see this even in though the original 1979 version of Gundam you know Shar is the sibling who is driven by anger and Sela is the sibling who is driven by sort of empathy and I think empathy comes from sadness and she is someone who her memories of this time are sad because she was a kid who had her mom and then she didn't have her mom right Mm -hmm. and i think shara's memories of this time are pure raw fury you know of like they took my dad then they kicked me off the planet they took my kingdom from me basically right and sayla doesn't have illusions about that because she's just a little kid with her adorable cat lucifer who last night i'm watching the episode and before they tell you the cat's name i kept trying to remember it and i'm like and i kept wanting to call it Gigi because that's the cat in kiki's delivery service that looks just like this cat and sayla even has her like little witch's hat in this uh-huh. episode so she kind of looks like kiki um but it is not Gigi; it is lucifer but it is an adorable funny cartoon cat who i like a lot yeah, I mean, God, there is there anything more adorable in anything than than Sayla trying to like jump off the back of the gun tank, like in <laughs> holding her like hat and having the cat on it, like at the same yes. time. It's just like you need little moments like this, like oh, this is so cute. Like, thank you, like, thank, yes. thank you for giving me like this moment of brief like levity and like you know, it's just like someone needs to they just need to have in the middle of like really dark dramas somebody looking at a funny cat video like that's just the thing that needs to happen every once in a while is to like <laughs> sort of as a palate cleanser for the tone of your your piece absolutely so Sela is the first one we're going to talk tonight uh, about today of several recasts that the origin has to do 
Um, this one, we now have the original actor was Yo Inoue, who voiced Sela on the TV show. And now it is Megumi Han, who does Sela as both uh, the child, Artesia, and as the adult throughout the origin. And I think it's a cool performance because she has to do the little girl voice here. And it's very, very cute and adorable. And then I think the adult Sela is a very good, you know, reinterpretation of that part. Yeah, yeah, and Meg Mihan is a great actress. She's been in a bunch of stuff. She's probably, the, her most famous role is that she's Gon, the main character in Hunter x Hunter. Obviously, that's a very different performance because that's a little boy. Um, but she's also another performance I really love. Actually, this is probably my favorite thing she's been in, in terms of, like, her performance. Is she's the main character, Atsuko, in Little Witch Academia, which is a really great Studio Trigger anime. Um, if people haven't watched it, it's on Netflix. It's a, it's like what if you made Harry Potter, but it was good is my general pitch for what <laughs> Little Witch Academia is. Um, and that's a little bit, Asuka's a little bit more in a broadly similar kind of space as Sela. Um, obviously more like adult Sela than this. Uh, like kind of like teen Sela is very Asuka-esque. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a really good piece of recasting. Um, and, and it's a, like, I think it's a, an impressive performance of being able to do both like little tiny girl Sela and like full adult Sela and we'll get to like appreciate that performance as it evolves throughout all the multiple phases um of like basically her in like through her adolescence into her adulthood that we'll see over the course of these episodes yeah absolutely <laughs> So where do you want to go with this next, Sean? Do you want to trace some of the story of this episode? Because I I really do. I mean, it's it's fairly obvious what the breaks for all the episodes are going to be from even just reading the manga. Like, I mean, the manga, this is in the original Tonkoban version is six volumes. And that aligns pretty closely to the six episodes of the um, of the origin TV show version. Um, obviously, this one, it's pretty clear the arc is going to be... Well, let's start on Munzo and and when they leave Munzo, right? Um, yeah. But I still think like the arcing of this is so good, and this first episode introducing us to this society, you know, ten, eleven years before the one year war, um, and seeing this sort of society on the brink where the Federation has a very tenuous hold on the colonies, but it is breaking even by the time we meet these characters because of the agitation by people like Zeon. Um, but I do think it's an interesting choice, and I think this is very intentional in the manga, and I think it's very intentional in the anime, that we start with Zeon's death. We don't really see him as an active, living presence. I can imagine a version of this story that starts even earlier, where we see, like, what was their relationship with their dad? And I think the implication is they didn't really have one. Uh -huh. Do you share that interpretation, Sean? Yeah. Like, this is where I think that, like, historical element um, of the storytelling is so vital is, like, if, as with any, like, actual, like, a proper piece of um, sort of, like, history understands that there are, like, things that we just don't know, right? Because so much of history is assumptions that people make about things. Um, and I like that here, I think Yasiko has such a deft touch with um, a lot of this stuff of not trying to tell you very specifically exactly what has happened for some of these things um and instead you have to sort of try to figure out or get a sense of your own interpretation and and i'm with you that for sure is the Zim daikun the impression you get is that he didn't have like a super like in-depth relationship with his children i think it is another like key moment though for uh castful that he doesn't have any moment with his dad, right? Like at least Artesia has like the one moment of of him picking her up and holding her. And then it's uh, one of like many really great touches early, like in the first five to 10 minutes with the Undoom Tycoon, where they intentionally animate certain sequences as if they were a 70s anime. Um, and that's one of those shots where they basically animate it as though it is like this still image that they do. Um, that 1979 Gundam did a lot with like, you know, when... Um, the, the shot I think of in that show is Kai after um, his sort of girlfriend has died um, at the end of that episode and it's this super highly detailed basically painting that doesn't actually animate they do that stylistically with him picking up Artesia as well um, and so you get that one shot of a sense of he does care about his family but he also cares about the big scale of like all this like political stuff that he's fighting for and Castle doesn't get this moment of his dad picking up and hugging him the night before uh, uh, Zeon goes to give his speech and then the other critical thing is that you are not given an explicit reason for why Zeon Zoom Daikun dies and there are like two you're given like two clear things you can pull on for two different explanations either and this is kind of what I lean towards and I think this is what you lean towards as well Jonathan that 
basically he has like a heart attack and it's just like a freak accident he's super overworked he's stressed the fuck out like he's so manic the night before he gives the speech it seems like he hasn't slept for multiple days and then the moment when he's about to give his speech he just basically has a heart attack or some sort of other kind of critical health failure brought on by extreme overwork and stress and he dies there and it's just this like horrible tragic coincidence that it happens at that moment and in the like historical analog to Lenin and Stalin, that is how Lenin died. Like Lenin had a series of strokes brought on by the stress of the Russian Civil War and World War One and like the Russian Revolution and all this stuff that he was overseeing. And then he finally had the stroke that like ended his life and then Stalin came in, you know. Um, and so I've always thought that's also part of why it's portrayed this way. Yes, but there is, but it does give you space to have the interpretation that the zombies would have killed him because there is also a sort of focus on as he collapses on the podium he knocks over a pitcher of water, water that falls yeah. to the ground which like in you know storytelling sh like visual storytelling shorthand is a way of indicating that someone has been poisoned by the thing that they have knocked over and dropped to the ground um and and then there's never any specific clarity on that like did the zombies poison him if so like which one of the zombies would it have been um, because I would, if it was anybody, I would assume it would be Giran and not even Degwin, because Degwin doesn't seem like the guy who would actually, he doesn't want to shake the, the nest too much. He wants to just sort of like have a stable scenario that he can softly manipulate to his benefit. Whereas Giran is the guy who wants to do the big crazy changes and the huge grabs for power. Um, and, and, and I think one of the things that's important is that it doesn't actually matter which one of those it is. Um, and, and this is true of like lots of historical figures throughout history is like sometimes it is you don't know did this person get murdered did they get poisoned like what because there are oftentimes theories that happen at the time about why people die that then politicized and used by different factions just as Zeon's death is politicized and used for different factions in this um and ultimately in the midst of a death being used politically like that it doesn't actually matter what the truth was like what matters is what what are people going to do about this sort of like opening of the power structure in this society who's grabbing for power and how are they going to grab it exactly it feels very much like real history in the sense of there is ambiguity at the root of this thing but what really matters is what people did with that ambiguity yeah. right there are so many there are so many wars that like like we have a lot more information now about how archduke ferdinand died than they did in the moment that like started world war one right but mm -hmm. that mattered less to the people in the moment than well, this is a this is an excuse to wage a terrible war, right? Yeah, and that's what I love here, and that is, you know, it is the, you know, you have Degwin Zabi, the kind of sleazy but effective politician in the background, who I, I think I agree with you, Sean. He is he is not someone who likes to necessarily rock the boat, but he is a great opportunist, you know, and he's got this political family around him, and I also love the attention to detail throughout this episode, and it's going to be true in all six of I think the very accurate characterization of these zombies as a den of fucking vipers and kind of idiots who mm -hmm. like do often stupid and self-destructive things and are fighting with each other as much as they are fighting with the outside world and even as they are making this power grab throughout this first hour you also see the seeds of their own destruction you know yeah I mean it's and it's another one of those historical things that is very true of lots of aristocratic and particularly monarchical families is that you know the most you know you're the per if you're like a king or a high-ranking noble the person who's most likely going to get your fucking head chopped off is like your brother or your son you know like it's it's someone else who is like in some sort of line to to take advantage of your death which is almost always going to be your, i mean and it's true of like as modern day like it's always like the spouse right it's, it's always like who is the person that's going to materially benefit from this this murder from this action um and and you see that whole attitude amongst the zombies um with the exception of um like dozel is like the one good guy right like he's i mean he's he's not a good guy in that he's still ultimately going to fight for people that are fucking awful pieces of shit but he is you know he has he's a very gentle sweet person at heart and i love that that like characterization is very true in the original show right like he's the guy who has the like the wife and the daughter um he's because he's Mineva's father um, and I'd like you see that kind of characterization here. Um, but then he's all of his like sort of three older siblings, Giran, Kaecilia, and um, the the one who gets murdered, whose name I can't remember because he exists to get fucking got. Sasro. Um, yeah, Sasro. 
um all three of them are the fucking vipers that because they are the ones who really care about being on like that throne basically here's a little detail i love in this first episode every member of the zombie family except dozel has a moment where they look in the eyes of the person who's going to kill them mm -hmm. right obviously you have sasro and kaecilia because the moment where she decides to kill him we see is when he slaps her you have kaecilia look eye to eye to shara's novel you have Garma look eye to eye with Shara's novel at the funeral. You have, you know, Degwin look at Girin. You have Girin look at Kaecilia. The only one you can't do that with is Dozel because Amuro isn't here. But, like, all of them are looking at the people who are going to get them killed, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's easy to do that because they're all their own family other than Shar. And Shar, they're doing everything they can to make sure that kid's going to want to kill them, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's not good. Um, but I love the, the flip side of this with the zombie. We'll talk more about the zombies in a second, but you also have the Ral family. And I like the expansion of the character of Jimba Ral as kind of like also crazy. He's like the uh -huh. other Zeon Zoom Daikun who is like, he's, he's died in the wool. He believes this stuff, but he is also overstressed and overworked and has lost the thread on this whole revolution, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's just this sense of that, like, he's kind of over the hill, right? Like, he's he's very old. Um, he's at like the end of his sort of like there's a he's like kind of going senile basically at this point um and he's got his like little weird bunker right later in the episode that Rambo finds him in in their mansion um that's covered with like pictures of him when he was younger and medals and all that he's got yes. his, like little like survivalist fucking bunker out back basically um yeah and then I, I like that characterization because um, you know, we never knew anything about Jimba Rao other than that Rambo Rao had a dad and his name was Jimba, and that, that is very <laughs> funny. That's like as far as it went back in the day. Um, but this characterization makes sense and is a good contrast for Ramba. I think you get the sense that Jimba was probably more like Ramba in his youth when he was young and he was in the military and he was like there with Zeon Zim Daikun, like pushing for this revolution. Um, and, but he has basically aged out of that and he doesn't really understand that fact yet. Yeah, um, which means you also have the characterization of Rambaral, who gets to be a major character throughout the origin. And I think a lot of what they a lot of what they do with Rambaral is really cool, and is also connected to at this point in the manga, you would have already had the death of Rambaral because that happens mm -hmm. before the flashback. And one of the things Yasuhiko does throughout the manga is we've made fun of this before that in the official canon, Rambaral is like thirty five or something, which makes absolutely no sense in the original nineteen seventy nine anime where he's clearly like in his mid fifties or something, right? Uh -huh. And yeah. Yasuhiko does rework it so that 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 timeline makes sense. Rambaral is younger in the manga, and obviously he's younger still here in the flashback. Um, but I really love Rambaral throughout all six of these, and his characterization here, and especially his relationship with Crowley Hamon. Fucking one of my favorite things about this episode and the ones to come. Yeah, yeah, and this is one of our recasts, right, is Shigeo Kiyama uh, voices Ron Burrell, and he does a great, great job. Like, I'm not super familiar with Kiyama's work. I haven't seen a lot of the other stuff that he's been in, um, but he does a really great job here. And there, again, one of my favorite moments in the whole episode is him interacting with Artesia, and it's just, like, the most like it's like what you wanted to see Ron Burrell get to do, right? right. And when you saw that Ron Burrell is like, he's this good like he's this good dad right or this good uncle um and he has that relationship right there is that history there between him and artesia in the original show you just don't ever get to see that actual flashback it's just through infl implication and they're like a couple of interactions before um Burrell is killed um and and it's so sweet getting to see the two of them together and get to see Ron Burrell be like happy for a little bit and get to like interact with these people and and not have to you know be the tool of the zombie family that he hates um which is basically his role for the rest of the series of gundam right um this is his one moment of like just getting to be kind of out from underneath a lot of that shit for a little bit yeah i mean he he sows his own destiny in this one you know because the only way for him to survive after he makes the moves at the end of this episode is to kind of be a tool right yeah um, but I do, they, they do, I think, a good amount of attention here to painting this picture of Ron Burrell's life as like, he, it's exactly who we saw in the original series. He's very competent soldier, very respected, very caring, like the, the kind of guy that if you're in the military, you would kill to have as your commander, right? Because 
that dude is either going to take care of you or give you a really good death. <laughs> it's kind of what you get from from Rambaral. And of course, in this one, we also see that you know he's part of this important political family, and he's built this basically network of information with his lovely, um, not quite wife, not quite girlfriend, not quite partner, something Crowley Hamon recast here as Miyuki Sawashiro who does amazing work here and in the episodes to come are you happy Sean that that your queen got to voice one of the great space queens Crowley Hamon yeah I mean it is it's like it's perfect casting you know I mean it's very much the kind of like character that like Miyuki Sawashiro it's like very much in her wheelhouse right of yeah. this like sort of femme fatale ish like Fujiko of, Mine like, or something yeah 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 where she's she's like the one she's the one who's like really in control and she has just like a bunch of really great moments i think most particularly the scene in the gun tank when she has to like threaten those other men and she just like beats the shit out of them basically um is fucking amazing and it's one of those where like it's why you want someone like miyuki swashro who she can just project so much power and control through her voice um as well as just being like kind of fun and seductive and all that kind of stuff it's just you know, it's it's Miku Swasho doing what she does um, extremely well, which is she's the best there is at what she does. So, yeah. Works. Well, and I think, man, if you were going to pick characters from first Gundam, from Gundam 79, that I want a cool prequel expansion uh -huh. of, it's Ron Burrell and Crowley Hamon, right? And I think they do such a good job of it here and again in the episodes to come of having uh, uh, of building out that history and it's it's what we sensed from that but you know like for Crowley in particular we only got to see in first Gundam in like basically in the 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 military with the boys right and so mm -hmm. she has a certain role but we sense something much bigger of like she is this unique presence among them and I think what you get here is that it's a very patriarchal military she is like the most competent person around them but she has to navigate this world very differently and the people who know her know her worth but the people who don't underestimate her and I think this first episode does a bunch of great stuff with that particularly in of course she's the one Ramba is going to go to to smuggle these kids out because she is she's the only one with the balls to run a gun tank down you yes. know main street but also she's the person who's going to like have the right people in place consistently um and it's and i love her relationship with the kids and everything it's just it's very cool yeah and and it's like the overall dynamic I, that's really effective it, like on that kind of historical level that the episode works on also with Hubbard and Raul is a sense of like these are the kind of people that like if somehow they were able to be the people in charge, things would go so well, but they're just not the kind of people who think on or operate on that level, right? right. They're not the big political people. They're not trying to make those big kind of political moves. It's like probably one of the reasons why the Rao family sort of falls into disrepair is that while Ron Rao is the best kind of person, he's never going to be the guy who tries to run the nation, right? Um, and, and even though he's super respected and he's super capable and competent, he's never going to be the CEO, right? He's going to be like that manager that his branch is the best branch in the company and everybody loves working there and he makes everybody's life better. Um, but he will never be the kind of person who can actually make it up to the top. And I think that's, you know, the first time I saw the origin, I will just, just to preview and not to try to spoil upcoming episodes, but like, you know, Ramba's arc in these six episodes is intentionally unsatisfying because he's heading to a place where he's the guy who's going to die as a cog in the system, right? And that is, and I think that's one of the things that's challenging the first time you watch it, but is so smart and is so right, is that you have to, it's a sad arc. I mean, the origin is in many ways a tragedy, except for Sharaz Nobel, who ends this thing on cloud nine, but he's about <laughs> to, you know, he's about to hit some turbulent waters, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that side of the show is fantastic. I also think it's, there's, it's, there's so many like pangs of emotion. Like when he walks into the bar and he says hi to like one of his buddies who we know is one of the people who like dies in the gun of an Amaro's yeah, hands. Clint. Yeah. Clint. Uh. <laughs> it's so sad, <laughs> but that's what happens when you do a prequel like this, you know? Um, but it's so good. So should we talk a little bit more about the Zabi family? Yeah. Let's, let's, let's dive into them. Cause I do want to talk about, um, I want to talk about my boy Guren Zabi. And specifically, I want to talk about Ginga Banjo. Because how yeah. the fuck is this dude still able to give that performance? Like, he was already, like, a full adult man when he gave the performance of Giranzabi in 1979. And somehow, he's still able to give that performance today. And he, like, he, he definitely sounds older. I mean, partially it's just, like, the recording technology is way more advanced. His voice is going to sound different. 
But yeah. he's still able to fully believably play that role, and it's fucking crazy to me that King of Banjo is like still active, you know? It's um, amazing. And and he is the only zombie who is not recast. Everyone else is a recast, um, but but Ginga Banjo, you do have his gear in. He does sound, as you say, notably older, but he still sends chills down your spine. You know, like, Giren is just one of the most notable villains, I think, in anime history, and he is so good. Yeah, and there are just so many little scenes, because he doesn't have, like, you know, a lot to do in this episode, but every scene he's in is so juicy, and in particular, the scene between him and Cassilia, where he's sitting there with his back turned to her, and he's playing fucking, like, virtual Go, basically. And with, like, and it looks like he's, like, learning how to play the game. He has, like, an instruction manual or something like that yep. open in front of him. And he's, like, playing this game of Go while Cassilia is trying to talk to him about some shit. Um, not really understanding that Giran is, like, really the person that's kind of in charge. That he's the guy who's assembling all the power around him. He's the person who's, like, making the schemes. He's the person who's going to make all these big plays. Um, and, and Cassilia, and this, again, like this kind of foreshadows their ultimate relationship in the original show. And then obviously where in the manga, it will go at the end. Um, but right. Cassilia is the person who wants to be on top, but both because she's younger and because she's a woman, she's like not going to be allowed to be in that position. Um, and so she's always like kind of at Giran's heels there. Um, but Giran has his sort of like authority in his position to keep her at bay. Um, and just the tension of that scene, I think, is so palpable. And a lot of it is is just Ginga Banjo's control of his voice, which is just such a wonderful voice. Um, it it lends such a weight to every scene that Giren is in. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking at all the voice actors on it's behind the voice actors dot com, and they have you know the character portraits, and then they also have like headshots from all of the actors. Uh, Banjo Ginga is a cool looking guy, I gotta say. <laughs> Yes. He's, got a, he's got a great mustache also you need to look this up anyone listening Mayumi Tanaka's headshot on that site is the funniest thing I've ever seen it's her like with short hair doing this like 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 with her hands under her yeah. chin which is just she is she is a delight anyway but I'm getting distracted no and I love that scene too Sean where he's learning to play Go and it's like this big like crazy like online version of Go he's playing right but I also love the staging of that scene because it is the eternal Kaecilia Giren staging which is he has his back to her and she is trying to talk to him and he is ignoring her doing his plans and that is how he will die right yes it's perfect yeah it, it is just yes the 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 foreshadowing there is so potent especially after like you feel like it's the big mistake that Giren makes is like Cassilia has already killed one brother who has disrespected yes. her right like she <laughs> like that's that's the big thing you learn here with her in the origin is that she's had practice before about yep. killing an older brother um and that Giren Giren is like the one person that strongly is implied that he knows what she did um and the fact that he doesn't sort of take that more seriously is the thing that's gonna get get him got at the end yeah. So what do you think about the decision? And I think I think this is so it's obvious that only, you know, someone with the stature of Yoshikazu Yasuhiko would expand the the canon like this of having another extra Zabi sibling we didn't know about who is there to die in this first episode to illustrate for you what a den of vipers they are. Yeah, I think it's a good choice just because it is a thing where you cuz you want to have that dynamic, but you obviously if you want to have it in this sort of like flashback era, you can't actually do it because all these characters need to be alive for it to happen to them at the end of the actual series. So like it having to, wanting to foreshadow that element um, and have it be like an active trait of these of this like set of characters in the past, you kind of need to introduce another character um, and have them get killed off. And I, I just think the way that they do it, that Yasiko does it is so perfect because one, you know, Cassilia is the character who has like, you know, she's, she's just, one of the coolest characters in that original show she's um like one of the best villains in gundam in like kind of a, like a quiet, more quiet way that she's not the main antagonist um but she has such a sense of presence to her um and she's such a compelling character that giving her this sort of um that vindictiveness that she has um and that sense of like you know she has this almost char like trait which i think is one of the reasons why they have her and char or like castle talk in this episode is that she also just so wants to be in power and is constantly kept from that and that she has this anger about that that eventually she'll let loose and start killing zombies just like what char will eventually do um and so that dynamic i think is incredibly rich but then also the way that he that sasha is killed of this 
um, car bombing that is staged to look like a political act committed by the Rouse. And so it's one of those like multiple pieces of this sort of like political wildfire going on that she isn't just killing Sasro, she's using his death as a political stepping stone to thrust her power, her like family, and thus her into a larger place of prominence in society. And that she doesn't seem to be worried too much about Dozel being there in the crossfire and Dozel just being such a fucking badass that he's able to rip out the door, stand up out of a flaming car and just <laughs> scream, who did this? Who killed my brother? God, ah! you know, um, like that whole scene is just incredible. It's incredible. It's and it achieves all the things that you talked about, Sean. It's also our prequel moment for how did Dozel get his scars, right? Yes. So we get that, which will come back very memorably at the end of the episode. Oh my god! But um, yeah, I love, love, love that moment. I even think there's a little bit of an implication that like that she is so surgical about it that that bomb is planted in such a way that it gives Dozel the chance to survive. You know, mm -hmm. like I don't. Th I, mean, I think it's planted like directly under Sasura is how it's yeah. shown because Sasura right. is like completely vaporized by it. Yes, but no, it is the the way the 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 manga does that with, with Dozel coming out of the car in a little more oblique way, where he comes out and like against like a um, it's a, one of the color pages, and he comes out like in like a sea of like kind of a fiery background, but it's also sort of one of those abstract color backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And in here, I love how they do it, where they they literally start with the car shaking and like ripping apart. It's such a good little piece of uh in that case cgi animation because the car is 3d um kaecilia though i agree with you she's great here i fucking adore her entrance and this is taken from in the manga it's a full page panel of her on horseback coming down to the highway but they do it great in the anime too where um ron Baral is trying to get away with the kids and he's trying to like threaten all the protesters on the road but he can't quite handle the situation and then kaecilia comes in on a horse because she's a fucking badass. Also connecting her to Shara's novel in yes. another way, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it is so... It's so great. This is a recast also. It's Akino Watanabe playing Kaecilia. Mm -hmm. But man, it, what a... It so perfectly captures the Kaecilia of the original series. It's really remarkable, I think. Yeah, because... Um, yeah, because that actress is uh, Akino Watanabe. She's in, like, a lot of stuff. She mostly... She's one of those actresses that either she plays, like really powerful adult women or she plays young boys right it's like yeah. <laughs> those two splits because she plays the little kid version of deku the main character in my Hero academia it's one of those of when you look up her character list and you see that character name you're like no she doesn't because Deku's <laughs> voiced by like a 20 year old man it's like oh right no there's, there's like large long stretches of prominent flashbacks where deku's a little kid voiced by another character um, but then she is um, one of the characters that she, she plays another role in My Hero Academia that's very good, which is Lady Midnight, um, which is this kind of like adult superheroine that's kind of a a parody of, of Wonder Woman, of like old Wonder Woman who is literally made by a dude who is like a bondage fetishist. And so like Lady Midnight is a parody of that. And it's, I find that character very funny and it's a great performance. She's also in like Attack on Titan and a bunch of stuff. She's really good. Um, but yeah, she captures, um, I think Mami Koyama, I want to say, is the original actress who she's basically retired at this point um and, but she captures a lot of the like strength and energy of that Kaisila performance which is so iconic in the original show yeah no that's fantastic i love the characterization of dozel um and very much what they do in this episode is true throughout these six is that he is part comic relief and he is also part window into this this dynamic that is there in the original show where he is the human being in a family of sociopaths, you know? Like, I don't know if Dozel is a particularly good person because he doesn't seem to have a lot of scruples about killing people and all of that. But he is a person with feelings. He is a person with some sense of morality. And, like, he's the one who will go, hey, that seems wrong. But he is also fundamentally a very simple person. You know, he is too simple to be evil. He is too simple to scheme, right? Um, and so he is the one who, you know, like, is, is screaming at them, of course you can't kill the people in that tank, that's the children of Zeon Zoom Daikun. And then it's Giren who's like, no, you're going to kill the kids in that tank. And he just doesn't really know what to do with that information, right? Yeah, yeah, that scene is fantastic. Because Giren seems almost confused by the fact that Dulcel, like, thinks that yes. that's an issue in any way. Like, Giren's so dismissive of the entire situation. And then Dozel is just completely dumbfounded by the entire thing. Um, yes. Which is, a, yeah, this is a really great little moment because that's also where dozel's scars open up in his like whole face starts bleeding one of like, my favorite Jesus scenes Christ. 
one of my favorite scenes in this they they really milk it in the anime in the in the manga it's this panel you can kind of see this here Sean I'm showing you on mm-hmm. camera where they open up and it's just the um it's the it's the poo hiragana that is all around him going poo 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 it's a very funny little moment um and then he's bleeding all over the place yeah I I love the characterization of Dozel as like this he's almost like a gentle giant but not that gentle I don't know how to say it other than that yeah it's like he he's amongst the rest of the zombies he's the gentle giant right he's yes. the one who actually like cares about people it's just he doesn't think on like a political or like you know a big scale or systemic level he only thinks about the things that are directly in front of him um and he kind of buys the things that people tell him right so like yeah. he 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 believes that Zion Zion Zoom Daikun was like important and that people should respect him because that's what Dozel has been told and that's because that's what as something that all the other zombies will say because it's the thing you're supposed to say but none of the rest of them actually believe it because they're you know they're just power hungry fucking narcissists so yes like they're just saying whatever they want to in order to sort of like get by in society and and climb up that ladder yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then the only other one we haven't talked about is Degwin, who is not in this episode a ton. But I will always love any Degwin scene because Degwin, uh, he's such a great character design. He is one of the most, like, for Gundam, I do, Degwin and Dozel both have this quality to them where they don't quite look real, you know? They don't mm-hmm. quite look like people. But I think that is such a great, I like, Dozel is the one who looks most like Degwin, right? Um, and here he's voiced by Jean Urayama um, and I always love any Degwin scene because just the sense of like the political calculus radiating off this man in every moment you see him is such a like palpable but like real thing, you know? He kind of looks like what you think every politician looks like under their surface. He's like what their persona would look like, you know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. He does yeah, he does look like a persona character, like a persona like monster or something, you know? Like <laughs> after the like everything has been stripped away, this is what's left is is Degwin Zabi. Um, but yeah, yeah, as you said, he's not super prominent here, um, but but he's he's just a, I think the characterization of like his relationship with Girin, you don't get much of it here, but just in the scope of Gundam, it's one of the most interesting character relationships of this guy who's like Degwin's like in many ways just as evil as Girin. It's just he's less of a fucking idiot about it because he cares more about the long term game. Whereas, yes. like, Girin is so focused on, like, the quick power grabs that ultimately it's everything is going to go to shit because of what Girin is doing. And Degwin knows that and can't stop it. And I think it's, like, a really cool intervillain dynamic um, that the original show has that you just get the kind of taste of here. Yes, absolutely. Because we're still in the, you know, we're still on the path where Degwin is pretty gung-ho about this big power grab the family is making, right? Whereas when we pick up in Gundam 79... He'd like to win this war, but he'd probably like to stop dropping colonies on people too, right? You know? Yeah, he doesn't see the profit in any of that kind of stuff. Whereas there's like clear profit in maneuvering his family to, you know, become ultimately what what the Republic of Zeon is um, yes. once all that stuff resolves. Yes. Um, no, but all of that is great. Sean, another historical detail I love in this episode, and it's with a character we haven't talked about much yet, um, what we've talked around her is Shar and Sayla's mom, Astrea. Um, and I think, you know, they, they do the part of that character that you would sort of expect in this show, which is that she is, you understand why the kids have an impression of her. She is very loving, she's a good mom, she is devoted, all of that. But you also see her role in the politics of this society. And this is something that is not hinted at anywhere in original Gundam. Mm -hmm. It's not in the novelization. This is one of Yasuhiko's inventions. And it very much feels like, again, the historian in Yasuhiko doing this, which is that she is... It's not clarified whether she is like Zeon's new wife or if she is just his consort or something. But Zeon had another wife, and that is that lady... What is her name? Lady Rosa Mia or... Not Rosa Mia, someone else. But it's like... Lady Rosemary or something. Something like that, yeah. Rosa Lucia. It's Rosa Lucia, sorry. Who is the, who owns like Zeon's palace, the mansion and all of that. And clearly still has a lot of control even after Zeon's death. But she could not bear Zeon. She was apparently barren or something and could not bear his children. And so Astrea came into the picture who is much younger than Zeon Zoom Daikun was. Much younger than Rosa Lucia. Um... And was apparently a nightclub hostess at one point, became like his consort, and became the mother of his children, but doesn't actually have the power that you would expect the wife of the leader of this society to have. And so she winds up, you know, locked in this tower by Rosa Lucia, who is clearly conspiring also with the Zobbies. Um, you'll, you'll learn in the next episode. 
I think that is a fascinating little dynamic that adds a lot to this entire thing. Yeah, and it's one of the ways in which, like, you know, the power structures are gendered, right? The, the, the sort of, the way that she is treated and looked down on for being someone who's, like, right? Because she's not someone who, like, seems to care much for or be invested in the ideology of Zeon Zoom Daikun at all. And that's, like, one thing that, that the woman, like, berates her for is she just runs down this list of questions like what is the difference between space noise and earth noise and blah 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 blah, and she can't say anything to that and part of like you know i feel like me watching this is also this like well like half of the shit that he said was like complete nonsense bullshit you know like the you know he had some sort of vague idea of there's a there's a new typey thing and then some people in the middle of a war started getting some weird psychic powers and people just started to call it new typeness um, but like none of like I think Zeon Zoom Daikun's a lot of his like actual broad philosophy stuff, especially when it's like spouted at you by this woman Resolutia like very hatefully. It kind of exposes I think how like kind of thin and kind of pathetic a lot of like the philosophical ramblings of Zeon Zoom Daikun seem in retrospect. And it's more just like the notion of space noids fighting for independence is good. The rest of this weird ideology is just like philosophical whatever um and and i think that, that scene portrays that in an interesting way because you didn't uh, actually ever get like a lot of detail on like the exact treaties or something of zeon zoom daikun but you get this broad sense of what his ideological ideas were and his philosophy was and some of it feels like a lot of horseshit exactly and i Again, I don't want to... Obviously, the only historical parallel here is not Stalin and Lenin, but I do think you also get this sense of, like, the, the Leninist idea of this, is this, this, that Zeon was this person who had, like, his philosophical clubs when he was younger, right? And clearly, Rosa Lucia came from that. Like, she's also an intellectual. Yeah. She talks about that. And that there were these groups, and they talked about all these ideas and stuff, and kind of like, like a Lenin or someone who wrote a lot and thought a lot and did all this philosophizing, but didn't prepare a lot on how to lead. <laughs> and then uh -huh. that's part of why they fall down, is when they get into leadership shit it's really hard and the world maybe doesn't want our revolution the way we want to do it and all these things are going to happen right um and so i think that's an interesting dynamic too of this sense of history where zeon is fundamentally from a different generation than um astrea and then obviously of course from his kids he's much much older than his kids um and and then his his wife or consort or whatever astrea is um and i like that whole sense of implied history because it just again it, it just makes the world feel so messy in a way that feels very historical and real it makes the world of gundam feel like it has a real history behind it not just some like lore on a wiki somewhere you know yeah, there's a specific detail that she mentions that she and Zeon Zoom Daikun were both second generation colonists. Um, yeah. And I think there's like a sense of like some of that, that paints that some of their philosophy was like almost done out of spite in some way. Because it's clear that like the early goings of living out in space and living in the colonies probably was a lot fucking worse than like the situation as it is now um, mm -hmm. for them living there. Um, and for like their children and all of that um yeah i think that that's another one of those interesting historical details um that probably like technically is true in the old canon but it's not something that's ever like specifically like touched on in any way right exactly it i mean it makes because like zeon's age is never specified in the original canon but it makes sense he would be older to have achieved the like level of power he has when he dies mm -hmm. you know yeah. um but yeah I, I love all of that kind of stuff what else is there to talk about um, with this episode, Sean? What other things did you want to bring up? Uh, I think one thing to just mention is is just like the art style and the aesthetic yeah. of the whole thing, um, because it looks so good. Obviously, some of that is is it's a hour long OVA, so it's got a lot more budget than a TV show would have, like per minute of animation. But also, it's I think there's a really great um, capturing of like Yoshikazu Yasuhiko's art in, in the manga stuff, and then also kind of blending that stylistically with, with this very naturally stylistically, with the original 1979 anime. Like, there's a lot of things, I think, very intentionally done to reflect stylistically things that that um, original series did. Um, things like the way that they use cut-ins in that kind of prologue where Char's in the Battle of Loom, and they have, like, the cut-ins of, like, his face and stuff like that is very stylistically feels like old Gundam. Um, I talked about that there's some of the shots, like the shot of Zeon Zoom Daikun holding Artesia is drawn and kind of painted in a way to reflect stylistically those kind of single frame, highly detailed images you would get in old anime. 
Um, the other one that I think is probably my favorite one of these because it's a replication of a shot from 1979 Gundam is Zeon Zoom Daikun's body that also has this very stylized gradiated background um, of, you know, if you have this like shot over shot of um, the, the Daikun family, the three of them like walking towards the body and, you know, to prefer shot to the body just sitting there with this color gradiated background on it super stylized and then eventually you know artesia like screaming into camera um but you do have that one shot and that kind of one flashback sequence in 79 gundam that shows the zoom daikun's body on a pedestal holding like roses or whatever and it has that super stylized background and one of the reasons why they did stylized backgrounds for some of those kinds of shots is because that was would be a background you wouldn't be able to reuse for anything because it's just this one flashback shot um right so it would be budget inefficient to create a whole elaborate background rather than you know a shot on the white base let's do a background for it because you can reuse that in a million other shots throughout the rest of this show um and so they would do these stylized gradient color backgrounds and they replicate some of that kind of stuff here in the origin and i think that that's just really cool in having it marry um stylistically what that old show did with obviously Yasuhiko's art style, which is already what the art style of 1979 Gundam was because he was the character designer and one of the animation directors on that show. Yeah. No, I agree with all of that, and I think those are very cool observations. I generally like the art and the animation in the origin an awful lot. I think if there's any complaint I have, there's definitely a feeling I get with a lot of like, I think this is, I think of this as like the sort of peak of the initial like, HD animation era before you kind of get like your UFO tables and your yeah. influences from like G-Reco also come in and kind of I think reshape a little bit of how we think about digital animation and simultaneously making it more mobile but also a little feeling more handcrafted and hand drawn and uh -huh. I do think there's some of there's a cleanness to the origin that it does such a good job of capturing Yasuhiko's character designs from the manga and how he draws those characters. But sometimes I wish it had just a little bit more of kind of the sketchiness of that. Because that's also there in 79 Gundam. Like, older yeah. anime also has a little bit more of, like, you can feel the pencils at work and stuff like that. And sometimes I wish there was a little bit more of that. Um, I think the CGI on the mobile suits generally is very successful, and there's... You see a little bit of that in the, the prologue here, but also when we come up on some of the later episodes, they're going to do some really cool stuff with it. It is kind of funny rewatching this after Hathaway's Flash came out, though, because you can also see where, oh, this is six years old, right? Yes. Because there's some stuff I think they try to do with the digital camera that they're going to be a lot better at six years later, which is fine. They probably needed to do the origin before they could do the stuff they do in Hathaway, but it is kind of funny to go back after we've seen the most recent thing they've done. Yeah, I'll definitely agree that I, I think that there's, like, there has been in the past, like, five to six years, I mean, around the time that the origin, like, started and started to wrap up, of of that kind of push of UFO tables overall influence on the way you blend um, and merge, like, 3D animation with traditional 2D animation um, has, like, pushed digital anime in different ways. And, and, and origin does, I would agree, has, like, too clean a look. Um, and it's, it is definitely most apparent if you compare it with Half-Life's Flash, which also is replicating a lot of like the style of old Gundam because it's, it's set in that universe, right? I mean, he's using some of that stuff while making it very revolutionary. Now, that's not an entirely fair comparison because Half-Life's Flash has a significantly higher amount of budget per minute of animation than one episode of The Origin has. And newer um, technology behind yes. it, you know. Um, but, it, but it is, I think, like, you know, it does sort of like stylistically date The Origin a little bit even though it's not that old, it does feel like it's um, from a slightly different era of digital animation, mostly because of how much some of that stuff has advanced in a relatively short time. Yeah, but, you know, again, this is sort of like looking a gift horse in the mouth. Mm -hmm. Mouth. It is still a very cool production. I will say this probably several times over the course of this series, Sean. The the CGI re recreation of Char's custom Zaku 2 is right up there with the... Um, with the custom goof from 08 MS team as my favorite mobile suit in all of Gundam. It is, I have, that's the first Gunpla I built, was the origin version of Sharzaku. It looks fucking good. We see that in the prologue here in this episode, but we're going to see a lot more of it, obviously, later on. Yes. I do appreciate that they put in that little prologue here, so you do just get a little bit of, like, actual mobile suit stuff, uh, because it, is, it, would, it would feel weird to watch an entire hour of a Gundam thing and have literally no mobile suits because the gun tank technically isn't really a mobile suit. Yes. Um, well, and that's yeah. basically the only change they make from the manga is adding the prologue and then they rearrange a scene. The 
the the the the flashback arc in the origin opens on this wide shot of Munzo which is recreated for the show and then it starts with Zeon's death and then the scene where Zeon is talking the night before is a little flashback later on they rearrange it so they have this prologue they add then the night before then the death of Zeon Zoom Daikun um, and that's honestly in this episode at least the only change from the manga they make um, but I think it's very effective to have the big action prologue to tell us where we're going and it's also a thematic thing to remind us that this is the story of how this little boy Casval becomes this um you know very flamboyant man yeah. shara's novel you know to to shoots down like three entire cruisers or whatever it is in that short prologue sequence yeah and it also means we get shuichi keda in this episode so he's in all mm -hmm. six because otherwise he he wouldn't be in this one and hey uh, anytime we get more shuichi keda in our lives is a good time the only other thing I think we needed to mention, Sean, from the story here is the promise that Astrea makes with her kids about the moon getting big yeah. 100 times. One of the saddest, most perfect pieces of writing in this whole thing. Yeah, that whole scene is just brutal. It's another one of those scenes of where, you know, Caswell is just like on the edge of it, just listening um, and knowing yeah. that it's like, oh, yeah, my mom's going to fucking die here. Um, he's like he just knows that in his bones that he's probably never going to see her again um, and, and yeah like the very fairy tale nature of the promise that the mom is trying to make um, then with the sort of punchline if you want to call it that but the reveal at the end very end of the episode is like the last moment because the moment that the, the episode ends on is Artesia seeing what the moon actually is um, and that it is this massive rock fucking in space. I mean, she doesn't understand anything of what the cycle of the moon is, obviously any of that, but, you know, the symbolically, that moment of realizing, oh, I'm going to have to wait for eternity, basically, because look at this thing. Um, look at the size and the scope of, like, the world and, like, you know... I mean, it's an amazing scene because it is the first time that they have ever, like, actually seemed to, like, fully understood that they were in a big weird spinning cylinder thingy right like you, you they've seen it now from the outside they understand oh every all my entire life was contained in this like spinning tube um and there are these big spheres out here in space that that like we're going to go to and it is like particularly for artesia who doesn't know any of that obviously like castle is like studied and knows it like intellectually but like that is such a like bizarre thing to imagine that you have never even really understood the concept of living on a planet um and that it's like there's this big ball out there that you go and land on it and it's like way over there and it's got water and stuff on it too is like that seems that's like a weird crazy mind fucky kind of thing and having her whole life turned on its head in that moment um as you go into credits is really powerful very powerful i also like the little there's so many good character touches two things i wanted to mention when Astrea, the mother, is giving that speech about the moon, you have Artesia is kind of like enraptured by it because she's being, being given this fairy tale hope. And you have Casval looking out the window, tearing up and trying not to. And mm -hmm. it's exactly what you're talking about, Sean. He is digesting the fact that while that is giving hope to Artesia, it is killing whatever hope was left in him because he's old enough to know better. But I also like on the other side of that, when they get out of the cargo bay at the end and they're out looking at the moon Casfall is a good big brother in that scene he mm -hmm. is trying to be a good big brother to artesia which is something he's going to struggle with in his life <laughs> but in that moment he does rise to the occasion and i think that's a nice little moment leading into credits with our our first theme song of gundam the origin which is called let me look this one up it's uh I got it. it's hoshi kusu no sunodoke which is like um like stardust hourglass um yes. which is by an artist named takuki hattori featuring yu yu yes so Taki Hattori is the composer, so yeah. Yu Yu oh, yeah, is yeah, the yeah. vocalist. Yeah, um, it's a good song. A lot of the songs for at least the first couple of Origin episodes are sort of like slow ballads that I can't like really use as theme songs on these episodes because they're too slow for a 30-second clip. But I do think it's really beautiful and haunting when you watch it, especially in its full context in the episode where most of the credits play out over the scene. Uh, I think it's really gorgeously done. Yeah, it's a really... It's, it's like it's a, a very iconic moment in my memory. It's like one of the things that, you know, when I f think about the origin, um, particularly like before doing all this rewatching stuff, like it, that is like a moment sort of burned into my memory is them out in space looking at the earth and looking at the moon while this song plays. Um, it's just a very Gundam kind of moment. You know, it like echoes things like the ending of Gundam F91 and stuff like that. 
It's iconic in the manga too because this is a full page cut spread they use as the back cover for this volume is the ship out on the moon basically Very good. or going by the moon so yeah anything else to say about episode one of mobile suit gundam the origin blue-eyed cast Vol, which we've talked about now for almost twice its runtime it's, for... it's really fucking good you know yes it's a, it's it's a, it's a good it's a really good bit of gundam um as i said at the top it just one of the most fun things about this episode in particular is like this kind of esoteric period in the history of the universal century that it deep dives into that is so far before the actual like core conflict of that universe begins um and getting to see char as a little luffy boy um it's a pretty cool time <laughs> absolutely now i'm imagining char with stretchy arms and it's all wrong oh, but wow. uh yeah what would char do with the gum gum fruit here write in and tell us what would char do? everybody he would just <laughs> kill everybody <laughs> all right Anyway, uh, now I'm trying to imagine Shuichi Ikeda going gear forth. <laughs> that would be very weird. Anyway, we will be talking much more about Gundam The Origin in the weeks to come. Next week we have episode two, Artesia's Sorrow. It's a sad episode. It contains a very iconic moment at the end. I am very excited to talk about it, Sean. Yes, I am I'm glad that we can finally not be ashamed by the name of the show and we can actually have a weekly Suit Gundam. <laughs>